here on October 25th. Uh, I am Peter Kosinski. Uh, we have Commissioner Kellner, Commissioner Spano, Commissioner Peterson here at the uh, meeting today. We will start today's meeting with the minutes, and we have several minutes that we have not approved over the last two months. We have minutes from August 8th, August 22nd, September 7th, September 12th, and October 3rd. Would anybody like to take them as a package, or how do you want to? Uh, I'll move that? that we adopt all of them as a package, and uh, just to point out that uh, uh, we just got two revisions. We did. Uh, from the slight drafts revisions. That were initially right. circulated. Right. Second that. And we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Sir, can I just? I'm sorry. We had a issue. Well, I just um, indicated in my statement on August 8th that I asked that the public comments that were made in reference to the regulations on the, um, the independent, my regulations, um, the subpoenas, I ask that they be made part of the public record. Um, and I noticed that there were other attachments that were um, included as part of the record and those public comments were not included. So I would ask that the public comments be made part of the record as I did um, on August 8th. I have another copy of them. The, the public comments in reference were really the ones that under SAPA are the ones that we did receive. Right. They were foiled from our staff to go to enforcement. Right. So they already are part of the public record that we considered in forming them anyway. Minutes are generally the actions that the board took, not necessarily other than it's also the video of the meeting and the transcript of the meeting right. are already posted on the website. So, yeah. Commissioner Kellner on prior occasions has stated that he w wanted documents that were offered during the course of the meetings to be attached to the minutes. Um, I that, offered them during... That, that's not accurate. I've, sa I've said that I wanted the resolutions that were adopted at the minute at the meeting or when there was a consensus discussion that those documents be attached but we've never attached the public comments before to well I understand that but I requested that be done during the course of my statement mm -hmm. and I think that it's important that the public knows and sees as part of the minutes of the meeting all of the public comments that were made and received. So I asked that that had been done, that I asked during the course of my statement that that, that um, be done and I'm asking that that be done again. In, this, in, in addition, my recollection that the resolution was passed 3-1, um, not 4-0, and the resolution that was included in the packet says, the minutes say 3-1, but the resolution says 4-0 at the bottom. That would need to be corrected. Okay, so which, which resolution? Which resolution is that? This is August, August 8th. Um, August 8th. Resolution 18-09. That's here, Peter. Oh, I so see the document. So we the minutes are correct. The minutes are is correct. Is that what you're saying? But the document correct. is incorrect. Yes. I got you. I can really see. It. Okay. So the document that the minutes reference should also accurately reflect that the vote was three to one. I, I agree so that, that should be amended and <clears throat> should reflect that it's three to one. I think as far as your request about the public documents, we'll take that under consideration. I agree with the commissioner. We've never included those before in minutes. They're, I they're, understand. But they're, you know, documents that people submit here. We get those all the time. We don't include those in minutes normally. We only include in the minutes, you know, documents that are approved as part of the meeting itself. Um, so, I, I mean, we'll consider it, but I think for today's meeting, we have approved the minutes. They are approved in the current form. If uh, the commissioners reconsider having an amended minutes in the future, we can we, we can consider that. But I think for today's purposes, we I don't think you minutes. voted yet because I interrupted you. But I'm sorry. <laughs> I think we voted, but we can. Oh, sure I'm we sorry. Vote. We had I a motion apologize. and a second. All in no, favor was aye. I believe we voted. 
So I think they're approved as is, and we can with, consider with that, one with that one correction on that document should should reflect a three to one vote. Yep. Uh, other than that, I think the minutes stand as submitted, and we can consider adding documents at a later date if the commissioners feel that's appropriate. So with that, we would move on to unit updates, and our first unit is the executive unit, uh, Bob Brem and Todd Valentine. Uh, just a quick update as we go through the meeting. It falls into three categories. I'll call them ballots, budgets, and the building. Uh, as far as ballots are concerned and the election, uh, I think we finally have all the court decisions except for the 13th. Oh, that's, that's done. Oh, that's done? Uh, I that's heard done from too. motion to consider was denied. I heard from oh, okay. Mark. So I'd like to think they're all done. I think we've heard today from Jimmy McMillan. I came in in the mail, I gave it to council. I'm not sure if that means we're back open or not. Okay. Well, to be right, he has amended his um, his complaint, um, but there's no timetable for anything to occur. There's no preliminary relief being right. sought. Okay. So, well, for all intents and purposes. For all intents and purposes, we have a ballot, which was, uh, to be honest with you, a struggle this year with a lot of amendments coming in and a lot of court late court decisions, not only for us, but in other counties, too. Uh, and uh, we continue with our security measures and our contingency planning. Uh, we're going to start uh, to ramp up just uh, any updates we get or intelligence reports we receive that indicate any significant threats. There are currently no significant threats. There are no threats pending against us, so we have nothing to report that they are actionable that they refer to us, but we will continue to monitor that. Then we'll start to ramp up our con our standard contingency plan. So if the website goes down, we have a backup website, we have a backup way to get to the phone lines if it doesn't work, that sort of thing. And we'll review some of these with the county boards. We have a month. We have regular call with them monthly, and that next one will be uh, Friday. Uh, we are preparing our budget submission, and Bob can go into more details. But basically, it provides. Uh, we we're going to seek additional funding over last year's budget. Uh, to accommodate the changes we needed to redirect staff in order to come up with the digital ad regulation and database that we had to put in place. Uh, there were no additional funds for that, so we had to redirect resources that we had on staff to that, which those were the same staff working on the CAPAS and FITUS update. So that has now put that behind schedule, and Bill Cross can talk more to the detail on that. So we need to get additional people to put back on put in the permanent f solution for or the permanent system for the digital ads database, but also to get us back on track for the campus and fight us update. And in addition, we're going to ask for what, what we thought was a second of three $15, million appropriations that will help us with uh, the mitigation or the, the fixes, so to speak, as from the risk assessments that we're getting from the counties that have started, just started to in the process of being done. We're hoping to have those done by February. But, you know, we'll need resources or money to provide those fixes to the counties, and we'll try to, over the next course of the few months, put in place a mechanism where they can procure those fixes once we figure out what they are. And the building continues to be an issue. Uh, I, we haven't seen any press lately on it, but uh, what I had prepared and had shared with Bob was, at this point, you know, we are being asked we have space constraints going into next year because of the additional personnel for uh, IT and for the Secure Election Center we've, we've obtained temporary space on the first floor in addition to the temporary space we had but we understand that that temporary space will no longer be available at the end of next year so we need to accommodate about 20 to 25 people in the existing space we're in now which is doable with remodeling but the initial estimates were $1.5 million for the renovation of this floor to accommodate that, which seems a little expensive. In addition, it didn't address some of the pest control problems we've had or have seen in the paper, which continue to be a problem. Uh, you know, they have put additional traps, but we still have to put our own resources into doing that. So what I prepared for is at least uh, something you should consider for sending a letter to the commissioner directly. We've talked to deputy commissioners, of course. We've talked to other staff and relayed these problems. 
but at this point it's something to consider you know if they're going to ask us to spend that amount of money and there's no indication that it's coming from some other resource other than our own so that's again an additional funds we put into the budget with something to consider it's like are, is there another space available that would be more cost effective that's you know why spend the money on that when knowing there are other problems that it doesn't address so it's just something for you to consider and then I'll turn over to Bob. Well, well certainly budget is a pricing issue it's due to be submitted tomorrow um, our uh, HR person Tom DeRose has been out with a, a back injury um, which is a you know, it's it's never a good time to be out the week that the budgets do. It's a, it's a little bit more challenging, but we believe we will have um, a, a submission on time. Um, it's similar to what we recommended before that it be fully fund the the uh, functions of the agency as we envision our uh, for staff and for the technology projects. Um, there will be an increase over last year uh, in order to accomplish that. Um, and, and mostly uh, the increase is the <clears throat> final technology push. We didn't envision a chapter that would require uh, one that the staff had to make something work this year on an interim basis. So that, that took resources away from working. How many staff are you dedicating to this new? obligation um, well it, there are a number that were already on board working on the implementation of campus Fidus and I believe at least four more but there are different kind of categories they fit in we already thought we needed to bring people in for some of the tech uh, equipment related um, efforts at the end uh, that were targeted but there are more program people that we brought in or bringing in now um, because we have to write program for the digital ad in the campus fidus none of that was pre-planned um, uh, up until the executive or until the budget came out in uh, April 1 so you know it's a matter of a, a great job working with council and staff how can we get something out this year but certainly the only way to make that happen is we had to use the people we had they had the skill uh, but I'm asking, how many of those current people did you have to dedicate to that one task? Bill would have the better number, but both programming, permanent staff, and there was there was portions of staff. It was portions of several people, based on a role, uh, were, were diverted. I don't have a full like. Is this a, like a account, is this is this a an ongoing obligation? Do you think, or is it an initial? You, do, you just have a ramping up, so and we, then it will level out, or do you anticipate using? several people going forward so the diversion for the the digital ads was it was was temporary uh, but that, that that took away from the mainstream project um, we're trying to regain time there the staffing that we're looking to add it's to basically accelerate what was already in the in the project plan um, most of that is temporary though that will that will end at at, at completion of the project, we do have a list of enhancements that go further, and there are certain staff who require to support an ongoing uh, effort in supporting that application. Um, that's primarily dictated, uh, <coughs> would be dedicated to, to state staff, in which we continue to try to staff. I'm just trying to get a sense, though. So three people, four people, ten for, people, twenty for, people? For overall development effort? Of for this task, this new task that we were given. Just a guess. I don't need portions it. of at least six people. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, so we're certainly working on that. Uh, we are finishing our onboarding of vendors for the federal and state <coughs> cybersecurity uh, money. Um, the uh, the plan that we presented to you included uh, risk assessments. Grant Thornton is that vendor. They have completed 13 on-site visits as of yesterday. They were in Erie County. Um, we, we are scheduling them through the election season, which is a bit of a challenge, and, and it is, is something we're spending some resources doing so they can be finished by February. Um, there's been a lot of cooperation, a lot of good uh, feedback we've heard from the counties they visited already, so I think the it's very positive engagement so far, hopefully, uh, as we get
get a little further along, we can have some of the reports to share with you uh, as they as they finish them. Uh, we only saw one draft for the first county they visited, Schoharie County. Um, but as that comes forward, are they going to um, visit all? They're going to visit every county yeah. as part of the risk assessment. Uh, the bigger lift that we have seen is more of a technology IT department, uh, you know, because it's a governance and a technology. The technology is mostly with regard to the IT department, the, how mature is the security around the computer network. But they're also validating um, the governance requirements of the Board of Elections. We had given them all of our statutory and regulatory and our procedures to make sure that when they do on-site visits, they are also checking how well they're complying with that. So those will also be analyzed in the report. In addition to that vendor, we have hired um, Dynatech, who partnered with FireEye for intrusion detection services. We've been working diligently with many people in the agency to try and get that paperwork ready uh, to go to the county boards of elections. Um, the, I think the most important part there is the, is the agreement between the vendor and the county. Uh, it's an intrusion detection device, so that you're going to put it somewhere in an area that at least covers the election infrastructure. Might include more than that, you know, if you're in a small county and you're getting everything. Um, but the vendor is going to get information and report that information to the county. So there's an agreement between the vendor and the county how they're going to treat that information and, and what are the protocols involved with that. We've been reviewing that both at the council level and the IT level to make sure that it is what we think it should be. I think we're pretty close to releasing that to the counties. So we hope to have a kickoff probably before Election Day. Uh, it, it's mostly a product that the county IT department would have the responsibility to work with the vendor to identify and size uh, the device. So we're making progress in that regard. The third vendor that we have secured is for managed security services, Sedera. It's a New York company out of Buffalo. I believe it's, called, it's Buffalo. Um, was the successful bidder. Uh, we've had it, two initial meetings with them to get their information ready for a kickoff, and that is a service for counties that really don't have any uh, existing way of monitoring uh, the, the information that the logs are, are being developed from the intrusion detection devices and for other services. What are the actionable items? What do they mean? What, what, what should the county do based on the information? that's being fed to them. So we don't, out of all those three products, that one's more optional for the counties. But what we've heard from many of the places we've been to already is a lot of the counties think that that's going to be vital for them. Um, I think an important point that, that we've heard from Grant Thornton for the risk assessment and the feedback from the counties they've been to is both county IT and boards of election have been very favorable <coughs> to uh, having help to get this project done and give them real advice as to what they could do better immediately to make improvements to the system. Uh, so, so it's really been a partnership. It's been one that the word of mouth from one county to the other is really helping uh, um, because they, they find it valuable. Um, so in May when we gave you the plan, you gave us preliminary ability to spend some of that money we will have an update for you at the December meeting to expand. Now that we have um, vendors. vendors in place, we'll start to get purchase orders. We just need you to authorize us to okay. expand. And where that. do we actually stand in terms of how much of the HAVA, HAVA money has been committed and how much is still available for future um, allocations? The, the federal uh, Help America Vote Act money, 2018, we have just under $5 million that we have not encumbered in our plan. Uh, all the rest are anticipated for the contracts we've signed or for the support of like NYSTEC and, and these HBITS people that are helping uh, to staff uh, some of the projects that from a security perspective and for the staff that we asked you to approve in the... Um, uh, for the Secure Election Center. So that's just under $5 million of the federal money, and that's a, an estimate based on the vendor. Um, and there's about 
five million of this year's state money that hasn't been uh, allocated under the plan. Uh, that's why it's important to have another five million because with five plus the other seven and a half, we think that will really help next year for the mitigation program, how to fix the list of items. So you do have a, a, a list of potential projects that will use up all of those funds? Yes, yes. Or exhaust those funds. And right now they're at the, you know, when we did the procurement, it was the estimate of the vendor based on what we thought the need would be. We'll know more about that as we get closer to February and the orders start coming in. Um, but we still need you to expand our authority. We've already spent about $200,000 actually, uh, and the authority was $1.25 million. But by December, we'll be well on our way to hitting that $1.25 million authority that you gave us. So we're, it'll probably be closer to $12 million, if not $14 million by December. So, so, for the, so we're, you know, budget takes a long time. Um, we have uh, dealt with a number of new staff members, both for the Secure Election Center and for other areas in the agency. Um, I think we mentioned that Maureen Cahill was retiring after, oh, I, I think she, was, she worked for two or three years during the 80s and was here since 1992. Uh, she was our senior program person in the IT department. Um, she was very vital to the work of the agency. Um, we're, we're, we're definitely going to miss her, and we're working hard to fill those positions through the state. Those are competitive. We've also, um, Tom Wood is sitting here. He used to be a nice tech employee, but as of last Thursday, he has moved to a direct uh, work with us as part of our Secure Election Center. But there are a number of people in the agency that, that have happened. One other one that has happened since then that will really be a hard, we've been very helpful to the agency, uh, Dennis Gerard, um, who runs uh, mostly the soup to nuts for the computer system. Um, he has a better title than that, but uh, <laughs> um, he is taking an, a, a promotion opportunity in the courts. It's their gain, it's really going to be our loss, and uh, Bill is is the few minutes of a day he had not to worry about something he's now seriously worrying about how to fill that position. So keeping uh, jobs filled, as you know, is never an easy task, and everybody is working hard to make sure that we at least fill those positions. Um, other than that, I don't think we have too many other, unless you have questions. Uh, I, I'm interested in learning uh, uh, what's happened with respect to uh, giving out in-person absentee ballots in Suffolk County. Um, yeah, we there were some press reports we did hear from the from some of the voters. Um, but yesterday, I received an email, and I think uh, um, I know I heard Brendan tell me he did too that they were able to work out their differences in Suffolk County. The commissioners uh, agreed to bring on some temporary workers that would allow them to do in person uh, from now through election day. So full time temporary people to solely handle the walk in. So I confirmed that with Commissioner Katz yesterday uh, and she confirmed they were actually supplying people yesterday and the temp workers would be there today. So they were able to work through their differences on how best to uh, keep up with that and luckily voters who need one can walk in and get one now. Problem solved. That's good. <laughs> um, then uh, some people have been raising questions about um, the New York City Mayor's Office um, providing interpreters for languages that are not already covered by uh, statute. Um, and um, uh, is there anything that uh, you're doing on that? Well, I, I saw that. Um, came in yesterday from Common Cause. They shared a copy of that with Todd just this morning because it was late yesterday I got it. I did have a chance to reach out to um, Executive Director Ryan. He was in his car going to a funeral, so we were only brief, uh, but he had expressed to me that the City um, of, uh, Board of Elections had been meeting with representatives of the Mayor's Office since May, a uh, number of uh, you know, in-person meetings and follow-up to try and uh, get information on where and and under what um, conditions um, people would be presenting themselves to offer translation services. And 
um, he had said that the questions that the city board had asked hadn't been answered yet. Um, other than he, he informed me that uh, at about 106 sites between Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island are where they want to send the interpreters. Uh, the mayor's office of immigration services uh, or, uh, immigrant, sure affairs. immigrant affairs um, was planning on sending people to work and that the city um, has developed a, a form and instructions if a person comes in as a translator with a voter uh, and most important thing is to get the uh, the oath the assistant oath that you have to administer to persons who are providing that service other than the Board of Elections. Uh, it's to make sure that they had one. Uh, they put it together last year when it was a pilot program in the general election, but they were trying to figure out where the city was, the mayor's office was going to deploy these services so that they could train the people at those sites. So that one of the questions, where will you put the people and they don't know where they're going to be. So it seems yet. like the major thing that we can do is to emphasize with the mayor's office that they need to communicate and work with the city board of elections um, if they're not in order to avoid embarrassment on the implementation of the program. Well, that's an issue we raise with any outside groups that want to come in, the media, uh, disability rights advocates, because the statute only limits who can be in a poll site for very, you know, poll workers, voters, <coughs> law enforcement, poll watchers, school groups, uh, children with parents. After that, there, you need permission from the Board of Elections to get into the poll site. So what we have advised previously, and this is in a similar category, they need to work with the Board of Elections in order to get authority to go into the poll site because you can't, you can't just, nobody, you can't just walk into the poll site. So that, that continues to be an we, issue, and yes, they should we, be We really need to emphasize that with the mayor's mm -hmm. people. Um. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I think we should. <clears throat> I agree. I mean, the Board of Elections has to control their poll sites. Otherwise, chaos. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how we get that across, but I agree that's an important concept. Mm -hmm. We can keep trying. <clears throat> you know, providing the interpreters is a is a good positive thing and could help the voters, but it needs to be, be done, done through the board. Way, right? Yeah, that's all. Yeah. I agree. And and I think the you know from the brief conversation I had with Director Ryan today, um, certainly they had there have been many attempts to complete that uh, communication uh, between the two, um, but as far as I understand today, it has not yet been completed. So we've, hopefully, the time left, we can be more productive. Okay. Uh, I, I just want to go back briefly to the office situation. So um, are you suggesting that we're asking if, if the agency can move our offices from here? I mean, it's, I'm, I'm hearing two different issues, I think. One is that you don't believe the office space is big enough it's for our enough. current staff. And then secondly, we have some ongoing problems with maintenance of the building, with infestations, infestations of the building from vermin. Uh, we seem to have issues. So what's the direction that the staff is looking to go here? I think we need to see all the options that are available on the table. And if you know remediation works, that's fine. But remediation has to remediate all of the problems that we've encountered, not just you know moving new furniture and new carpets, which is also a problem. But you know, so any solution has to accommodate all, it has to fix the problems we have, not just jam more people into the same space. So if moving is an option, then we need to know what that is, and we need to know what it is soon, because our window to make any of those changes is only through, really only through next year. After that, you know, we, we don't, uh, even when we moved here, it was very difficult to do that during an even year. And we only did that under duress, and we never got the accommodations that we wanted at that time, or very little of what we wanted. Um, so I think we're open to at least having the, because OGS controls your space, so at least asking, well, you know, what are the options here? And, and we understand we can start to go down both paths if need be, and we have to some extent. But I think they should at least put that on the table. That should be put on the table. Is that an option? 
and the, the, the restructuring of the present space. That's already on the table, no? Well, in order to get that accomplished in the time frame, we're at least willing to look at that because we need, in order to get yeah, those additional people on here, we have to start looking at, you know, what space do you have, you know, what options are there. They've recently renovated other floors due to flooding problems on the floors, which impacted us to some extent as well. Um, it's really awful. Yeah, I know. We're not here all the time. So we're, yeah. I mean, the, the mice are everywhere all day. You know, the talk of bed bugs, uh, urinals leaking on people's desks from other floors. It's well, disgusting. That's what the did, too. Uh, I mean, the one above us and the one below us. But, you know, and, and you know, we asked for help in February 3rd, I think was our initial meeting, to get the temporary space that we've now acquired downstairs that was completed September 15th. So it takes a while for this process to work. Um, when we accepted that space down <coughs> on the first floor for those 24 p people, uh, they, the information from OGS was it's temporary um, and that we needed to plan that move. Um, it's, it's not an easy time around September 15th till election day to take people away from <coughs> managing the election to try and figure out a floor plan. Um, so Todd and I wanted to make sure that there were, how do you pay for this? We've been asking that question since we moved here. How do you pay for doing this part of it? Um, so the OGS contacts for paying our bills and the division of budget, we had a meeting and we said, how do we pay for this? There's no reason why we should take staff away from running the election and play in this if we have no way of paying for it which is foolish. And Division of Budget at least said, well, we understand you need to do it, and we're willing, you know, if you put a reasonable plan together to sit down and, and agree we have to pay for it. I don't know what that means, but at least it was the first time it makes sense to plan. You take your staff sit and that was down. just last week, so now we're going to sit down in probably not the next 11 days, but soon, and try and figure out how do you make this work, and then what are the alternatives to this working. Um, do you do that internally with the staff you have, or do you consult somebody who's a space planner or what? Well, OGS has an office of space planning. Uh, there's a person, a number of people in there. They give you, they, they assist us in drawing up the plans, and mm -hmm. and you know she's already met with our staff, provided uh, a number of floor plans. That you know they've just renovated three floors in the building that we could look at and maybe get some ideas. Uh, but, but the cost is expensive, one million to one point five, and most likely one point five, based on what they recommended. Um, it seems high to me, but does that money come out of your budget, or does it come from somewhere else? There is no capital fund that it comes from, so you'd have to convince budget to put it. Unless it's budget or our budget, as long as it covers the expense. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to put it in our budget because it's what they told us, and we'll see what happens by the time we get to April 1st. And we will be much farther along in space planning by then, and I, I, I don't know who would pay to move us anyway. Um, in addition to, and I'm just saying this for the staff, people that have come to us, uh, it's not just inside the building. People have been accosted coming out of parking garages. People have been... You know, there's people urinating out in front of the building. It's an outside issue as well as an inside issue that has a lot of the staff very afraid and kind of demoralized. So, so they would like to be somewhere else. Yeah. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Hmm. Well, we only moved a block well, from the last place, so I don't know. I don't know what the options are. <laughs> I'm just listening. It's been up in reality. That's all. Well, let us know what so. your. Uh, direction is then as to how you want to address this so yes all right uh, next is the council's office uh, Kim Galvin and Brian Quayle uh, we have been since since our last full meeting we've been very busy I know there's been some interim meetings to go over specs and ballot access decisions so obviously we were working on all of those things throughout the process um, in addition, there's the 10 or so other non-ballot access cases that uh, much of the staff is dealing with the Attorney General's office on and some, and 
handling them handling ourselves uh, separately. Of note on those cases of the Eason case, the website accessibility case, um, uh, that's almost completely resolved. I know that there's been numerous meetings. There's now an accessibility coordinator. Is that your title now, John? I believe it is. Um, and staff meetings to try to implement the provisions of that agreement. Um, and there's a conference scheduled in, uh, for November 2nd, Friday, in the Southern District on the Common Cause lawsuit, which is the case that involves the inactive voters uh, being in the poll book or not. Um, later on the agenda, we have obviously some... Well, Kevin, you mentioned Common Cause, but uh, I think there was a very significant court ruling uh, a couple of weeks ago um, where the judge essentially said that uh, uh, our statute complies and the, the only real issue is whether um, uh, the way that uh, boards of elections yeah. are implementing the law uh, have the effect of uh, depriving inactive voters. Right, which the, seems to be the only relief would be some sort of remedial order against the boards or something of that sort. That's right. And I think the key there will be for the plaintiffs to identify actual cases where people have, uh, um, have not been able to fully exercise their right to vote. Uh, I'm kind of skeptical because I think they would have already identified them if they were out there. Um, but um, I know that the, the co-executive directors and many of the staff have been reaffirming with the county boards the training that their, their poll workers need and, right. and that sort of circumstance. And certainly if, if uh, the plaintiffs in that case do identify the problems, that's a healthy thing because then we right. can address them. Um, all right. Sorry, but I just did want to comment that the that, that the court did rule that the uh, dismiss the challenges to the constitutionality of the statute. Uh, later in the agenda, we have two other major issues that have occupied a lot. Of, well, I wouldn't say a lot. One has uh, of our time, which is the final adoption of the independent expenditure regulation since the emergency adoption in August. Um, Many of us have continued to meet with advocacy groups on behalf of the various organizations, making sure everything's in line. Um, and we can go over that in more detail when it comes up on the agenda, if you'd like. And then uh, the child care opinion we've had some discussions on. Uh, with regard to compliance, uh, we had a fail failure to file referral done to the Division of Enforcement uh, on 926 2500 committees for the July periodic and compliance has hit a milestone that they'll be happy to hear me mention of 100,000 reviews since the inception of the unit they had a cake it's nice um, so they're doing their work and they're doing it well um, with regard to the independent expenditures Brian's PETA's political uh, independent internet digital ads the new database went up on uh, 9 9 the public can now search the registration documents for the independent expenditure committees as well <coughs> as view uh, the communications that have been filed uh, in anticipation of that going live the unit sent out letters to all of the registered IE committees explaining the new regulations what they had to do and as new IEs uh, register uh, they're advised of the same rules and regulations that go. Um, and the new trainers, uh, as you remember, the two senior long-time people have retired, so we have two new people uh, doing the training. Uh, they're ramping up. They're getting ready to do a webinar in December on winding down the campaign. And then I know they have some uh, local in-person seminars scheduled for uh, early January to assist the local counties and get their feet wet on that process. And I, and obviously the county boards and the county calls and the people calls and am I registered to vote calls that we all answer. Do you have anything else, Brian? No, it's pretty thorough unless there are any questions. Any questions? <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Then we'll move on to Tom Connor. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh,
obviously since our last full meeting, uh, we've been busy with a number of different things. First and foremost was the state primary. So obviously we uh, were working with the different county boards to help them in their preparations for the primary election. Uh, we did certify the results for the September 13th primary. Uh, shortly thereafter, we um, certified the list of the roll call of the delegates and the alternate delegates for judicial conventions and provided that to uh, the conveners so that those conventions could be held. And out of those conventions came a number of nominations for Supreme Court, which we then processed. Um, there were 92 candidates nominated. There were five objections and four specific objections filed to those nominations. Um, which then led us in obviously to the general election ballot, uh, which we did certify and as was mentioned previously, um, was amended a number of times because of a number of different changes, some of them resulting from the nominations to the Supreme Court. Uh, we did create sample ballots for all the different systems that we provided to the county boards, including um, explaining to them some grids from how to lay out the judicial um, offices. Uh, we also assisted them with additional any kind of additional ballot layout or uh, design slash usability issues that they may have had. Um, as I mentioned, we did do a number of amendments. Um, unfortunately, due to the accident that happened over the Columbus Day weekend in Skahari, uh, the Montgomery County Board lost its deputy uh, commissioner. Um, so that board was really um, was hit hard by that on a number of different levels, one of which obviously being that the deputy commissioner was responsible for a lot of pre-election uh, work, including building the ballots and other uh, other tasks. So we did send out, uh, we offered a number of uh, on a number of occasions any kind of assistance that we could provide. I know some other local county boards also did so. Uh, we did have Bob Warren and Charles Smith from our unit go out there this week to kind of make sure that they had everything uh, under control, that they were doing all the necessary tasks and to provide any assistance that we could do uh, to them. Um, we do continue to work with, with IT and the county boards in our preparations for election night reporting, reaching out to them, making sure that they're all set to uh, provide us those data files on election night, and making sure that they are what we expect them to be. Um, <clears throat> we also, uh, from an accessibility standpoint, the Self-Advocacy Association of New York State uh, had a conference in Albany, and we provided uh, machines of both types, the Dominion and the ESNS, uh, so there could be demonstrations for their voters. Brennan and I also had a meeting with the Disability Rights New York where we discussed a number of different options. Um, the ICE machine, which is by Dominion, which is up for um, this resolution on the agenda today. Also, their uh, poll site surveys that they do, that they have done, they were planning to do on Election Day. And also, any uh, input if they may want to, we gave them a copy of our poll worker training uh, and some of the other work that we had done back in, I believe, 2012. Uh, where we had put together a non-technical guide for the accessibility of poll sites just to see if they had anything that they thought might uh, be important to be added or that has changed since then, <coughs> uh, which we thought was a good meeting. Um, there were also 11 asset audits that were completed in October. Uh, on a voting machine front, obviously the Dominion ICE machine, we completed the certification testing, and there's a resolution to certify that system, that upgrade. Uh, on the agenda, Clear Ballot uh, came on site to set up some of their hardware and software for uh, an upgrade that they have submitted. Uh, ESNS has been in contact uh, with us regarding their express vote machine, and as was, uh, we were also exploring the possibility uh, of a request from the village of Portchester for using of an ESNS machine, which has not yet been certified. Uh, but there was only a preliminary call on that so far. Uh, from a cybersecurity standpoint, Bill and I did attend uh, a nice Glitta conference, which is basically the, the local government IT directors association for the state out in Binghamton, and we gave a, a presentation on the different, sorry to mark that off your list. <laughs> I'm done, I'm on board. <laughs> I don't have a report left at this point. <laughs> uh, we gave a presentation on, on the board's uh, efforts from a cybersecurity standpoint, and the things that we were that we were doing that have already been somewhat discussed by the co-executive directors. Uh, we continue to participate in all the plans and calls on those, uh, those tasks. We uh, have hired three, or we have three positions in the Secure Election Center that are housed under, under the Election Operations Unit. We have now uh, hired three people, and they've all started. Tom Wood, as was mentioned before, is one of them, and we also have uh, Jason Wright and Keith Possen. Um, so we're happy to have them on board, and they've hit the ground running, and we plan on putting them to a lot of work. Um, and what do they do? Um, so for the most part, we uh, Tom is, is kind of heading up the, the, the two um, election security specialists, and overall what we're looking at is not just the machines, but also the procedures, we're looking to kind of enhance the procedures that we have on file now with any kind of cyber components that might be missing. 
Uh, we're planning on going out and, and, and doing board visits after the risk assessments so that we have a better idea of what we should be going out and looking for from a security standpoint, from a cybersecurity standpoint, helping them with their contingency plans to make sure that they're up to snuff and kept current, um, and also providing uh, recommendations for some either best practices or developing some guidance that we can then send out to the different county boards. Um, all, and I'm happy to announce that uh, all county boards in the state of New York are now signed up for the Election Infrastructure ISAC, uh, which is uh, housed over the river, but it's uh, basically the ISAC that was created as a result of the designation of elections as critical infrastructure back in January of 2017. Um, it's been a very useful resource for both us here at the state level, but also at the county level. We are the... Oh, the Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And that's a state... Uh, it's the center, or? no. It's 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 run by a nonprofit, the Center for Internet Security, and they originally ran the multi-state information sharing analysis center, um, which New York State was a part of, as of all the states. Uh, the Election Infrastructure ISAC came out of the the Government Coordinating Council, which was which was created as a result of the designation of elections as critical infrastructure. Uh, we decided that we or the GCC decided that they wanted a an ISAC for the elections. Uh -huh. Oh, I, I, well, I, I had mentioned the longer version before. So uh, when you have a <clears throat> critical infrastructure, there are generally two bodies that, that, that kind of coordinate and also kind of deal with intelligence and action items. There's the Government Coordinating Council. So in the case of elections, it's made up of state and local election officials, as well as a number of federal officials in DHS and EAC and other agencies. The SCC, or the Sector Coordinating Council, has to do more with uh, the vendors that are a part of that space, so they can share information securely with one another, and then the GCC and the SCC can also coordinate together. So the Government Coordinating Council had decided back in February of this year, right? It seems a long time ago, but it was actually still this year, that they would designate the Election Infrastructure ISAC as the one for the elections um, subsector of critical infrastructure. Um, like I said, so they are housed across the river in East Greenbush. Um, we are the sixth state in the entire country to have all of the jurisdictions become members. So we're happy about that. So uh, by the, what become a member, what does that mean? So basically in order for a county to become a member, there has to be both a technical contact and, a, and an elections contact. Um, the way that the information sharing and analysis centers generally work is that um, information is shared amongst all members. So any information coming in uh, gets analyzed by the ISAC itself, and that th then distills that information into any actionable intelligence or intelligence that I think is important enough just to share to make people aware of, and it sends that information out. Now the, the difference between, let's say, the, the multi-state information sharing analysis center and the election infrastructure one is that the multi-state is far more technical, and so those emails and those alerts and that guidance is, is really meant for IT directors. Um, whereas the election infrastructure ISAC, we've been working with them to really try to, to distill that information down into something that's more uh, digestible for election and policy people. Um, so that was also, they were also the, the origin of the, the handbook that I participated on um, for security of elections infrastructure, which is also the basis for our risk assessments that we've been doing with the different counties. So I was just happy to see that we finally got the last county on board, I think last week. You had mentioned paying the bill. The Federal Department of Homeland Security has been paying for the MSISEC and the EISEC services. So it's still one of the, I mean, there's other services that the state of New York is a benefit of from the funding at the federal level um, through the Homeland Security Department. The New York um, uh, liaison, uh, he's the Northeast, so, or, or, you know, John Durkin is going to be here this afternoon to meet with us. Uh, to go over um, pre-election preparedness, but certainly our partners at the Federal Homeland Security have been very helpful to New York State. We and we're utilizing whatever services are that, and so far they've been free. We like that, and they've been helpful. So other than that, I think we've been kind of doing our normal run-of-the-mill kind of stuff, and obviously preparing for the general election in less than two weeks. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Any questions? Okay, thank you. We'll move on then to uh, NVRA, PIO, John Conklin, and Cheryl Kauser. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, well, Public Information Office has been very busy since uh, our last meeting. Um, some of the hot topics have been, obviously, the September primary, 
uh, campaign finance uh, disclosure reports that have been filed since August. Uh, the governor's order on uh, granting conditional voting pardons continues to be a hot topic. Uh, cybersecurity uh, articles and questions about preparations for the general election. Uh, and then most recently, as mentioned by Commissioner Kellner, um, the, uh, I'm sorry, you didn't mention this, the mayor's office on the Democracy NYC mailing. Um, so uh, we did a press release uh, in response to that. Uh, we also had a press release done on um, some possible uh, voter registration scams that were occurring upstate in the southern tier where people were receiving texts and phone calls asking them for personal information um, to register them to vote. Um, so we did a press release warning, warning people about that. Um, we also did press, two press releases reminding people on the voter registration deadline for the primary and the general election. Uh, the unit participated in the monthly ECA calls in August and September. Um, we participated in all the cybersecurity plan meetings. Uh, we've processed 116 foils in August and 111 in September. Um, as Kim mentioned, uh, we've been participating in meetings uh, on the Eason lawsuit with Council's Office and IT uh, on the responsibilities of the Accessibility Coordinator. Uh, so we've basically sorted out our responsibilities between this year and next year and largely we've completed or substantially completed all the tasks that we have to have done by the end of this year. Uh, so we're starting to look toward next year. There's a couple of things that are still outstanding, but they'll be done after, after the election. Uh, as we have a new employee in the public information uh, unit, Courtney Padlow. Um, she's part of our allotment from the Secure Election Center. We have one more position to fill, and we've done interviews, but um, we haven't made a decision yet on who that person's going to be. Uh, we also met this week with uh, two long-term international observers from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, this is an organization that comes to observe U.S. elections every two years. Um, they're invited uh, at the behest of the State Department. It's an organization that the United States and Canada participates with, and I think it's almost all the countries in Western Europe that are part of it. So. We have two long-term observers. There's also going to be, in addition to that, 28 short-term observers that are going to come to New York City. Uh, that group is largely made up of elected officials from various European parliaments. Uh, so we've had conversations with the New York City Board about that. They're, this has happened before, so they're familiar with the process. They'll issue a credential for them to be poll watchers on Election Day. Um, with regard to the website, uh, we're, we're updating the candidate website's page to remove the people who were losers in the primary. Um, Cheryl went through all the candidates, um, and I just have yet to approve that list, but that should probably happen this week. Um, as Tom said, we're participating in the election night reporting stuff, working on the zero files. Uh, we have posted a list of uh, nominations received for this. I mean, because we're going all the way back to August, so we did post a list of nominations received for the September 13th primary. Uh, we have posted and are continuously updating two certified lists of federal and state candidates for the general election. Uh, we put up the webcast and the transcript for the August 8th meeting. Uh, we have transcripts up for the August 22nd and September 9th, September 7th meetings. Um, we're working on the transcripts for the other two. Um, that are not up yet, which is September 12th and October 3rd. Um, we've also uh, posted filings for independent candidates for Congress and for state offices, and we posted the proclamation uh, and the political calendar for the special election in the 25th Congressional District in Monroe County. Uh, with regard to NVRA, um, we've had Eight board visits since the last meeting, Chautauqua, Cattaraugus, Allegheny, Steuben, Schuyler, Tompkins, Oswego, and Jefferson, and all those counties were found to be substantially in compliance with their NVRA responsibilities. Uh, the unit would like you to know that they traveled 2,450 miles to do those eight <laughs> board reviews. Uh, we've also had three separate training sessions in New York City 
uh, and we've had about 150 people attend those three sessions in total. So I think that's everything I have. Do you have anything you want to add, Cheryl? No, thank you. Okay. Can you talk just a little bit more about that scam that you were talking about, the upstate? What was going on there? Uh, it seems to be pre predominantly in the southern tier um, around the Elmira, some in, in the area between Elmira and Rochester. Uh, people were getting text messages and phone calls saying uh, they weren't registered to vote and they could help them register to vote if they would give them their personal information they would register them over the phone or online um, which you can't do in New York State unless you have a DMV license but it doesn't operate that way people doesn't call you and ask you for your personal information so we put out a press release to warn people that did get picked up in most of the regional newspapers and the television stations warning people about it is, is that ongoing is there more information on it or when we did it we heard from just about every commissioner in those areas saying yep we got calls on that from people in our district I haven't heard any updates since then so I think the warning pretty much tamped it down okay, any idea what was going on there? we have we did refer it to um, the cyber incident response team um, and they are still I believe investigating. I don't think it's been closed yet we haven't got Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you. And then we'll move on to uh, ITU, William Cross. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I think much of my report's already been touched on by one way or the other from, from everyone else. Um, you should do what they I, do in the British Parliament. Just who? say, I refer you to all the answers my colleagues have given before. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I'm interested, <laughs> I'm interested in hearing what the current schedule is now for the implementation of the campaign finance disclosure updates so our which are now like four years behind schedule <laughs> so our initial um, our uh, projected date was April 19 um, we have not because we have not fully we have not fully staffed um, restaffed that effort or added the additional experts we're trying to we haven't adjusted that we know we are we are behind um, that day. We're, we're we're beyond that date at this point, but we have not calculated what the new date will be. I don't think it's significant, uh, as I mentioned. I think in our last report is, is when we do we are, are able to eight, uh, onboard the HBIT staff and fill the outstanding program where we have we have a better sense of of what that will be. Um, I don't have a guess at this point. I don't think it's a significant delay from that original April date, um, but we did definitely take an, uh, an impact due to the uh, paid digital ads in, in two ways. One is diversion of staff to put up the stopgap measure, uh, and the second is now to work in the full implementation into that, into the, the main project, um, because right now, um, what we what we implemented was definitely a stopgap. It was the basics of meeting the legislation as required in the time frame required. Um, the full functionality of that requirement, including what you would typically expect from a database application, such as you know, searching and, and a work uh, independent expenditure committees to submit their own um, digital ads without going through in a manual effort, that needs to be incorporated into the main project, and we don't have full details of what that effort looks like at this point. So that in two ways, uh, we need to adjust uh, adjust that schedule. Um, I will provide a estimate data as, long as, as soon as I can have something that accurately to, to base it on. Um, Bill, in, in, in addition to that, we had looked at a prototype of what you were working on, I don't know, a year ago. I'm going to guide. I don't remember the exact time. I'm wondering if you have anything new to show the commissioners about how this new system will look. I'm primarily interested in how it will look to the public mm -hmm. and what the search process will be for the public. I don't know if you have anything much new of the, on much that. Of the, we, can arrange, we can certainly arrange an updated demo. Uh, much of what we, we showed previously in terms of user interface and searchability and things like that has remained the same. Much of the work that has occurred uh, since then, it has been more. Uh, that's that's the face of the application. The, the 
much of what we've been working on in terms of is business logic behind the scenes of the application, not so much of the, the front effort. Um, since that time, particularly with the, fi the filing and a lot of the internal functions that the public wouldn't see, such as the generation of a political calendar and um, a lot of the EFS uh, processing um, and reports. Um, but certainly, if we we have anything updated, I can we can arrange an updated demo. Uh, it might be very repetitive. Rep of what you've already seen. Well, I think we had we some that. suggestions for some alterations at that time. Right, and I, we did. I'm sure you did, so yeah. I'm just looking to see kind of what it looks like okay. now. You know, whenever you get a chance. I mean, I'm not, I know you're busy and I don't want to we'll interrupt <laughs> things, but I think at some point I would like to see it before it goes to final. Oh, absolutely. You yeah. know, so we get a chance to have some input. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we will actually be engaging. Uh, we're currently working out what our outreach is now to our, our predefined beta test team to ramp up, which will represent counties and treasurers and, and, and such. And we'll have, when we get closer to actually a functional end to end piece to have them test. Um, in terms of staffing, uh, which has been a challenge since day one, at least my day one here, uh, uh, it's it, like usual, it seems. One, one step forward, two steps back. I am. We were able to add one of the developers I've been been trying to fill for for some time. Uh, uh, he's joined the team and is working out well. But as reported, uh, we lost uh, two other key staff. Uh, one to re due to retirement, one to transfer to a different agency. They are, represent a, a huge hit to us. Um, we are again still trying to uh, augment both those losses and regain the time uh, for PETA with some additional contracting staff, those those orders are currently out and we're interviewing uh, for those. Uh, for the NICE Voter Project, uh, the key installation of all the new hardware, software, storage, networking, the whole infrastructure uh, has been completed. Um, on the, new, the NICE Voter System has all been virtualized, which is um, Basically, to summarize it, it take, uh, the old system required a, a physical server for every different component of this system. We are now able to virtualize that and compact it and, and utilize much, uh, much fewer servers, much less infrastructure to actually maintain. Um, we do work, continue to work with the vendor to finish the implementation of the disaster recovery procedures and, and final testing for that portion of the project. We're also continuing on the development of the in-house move application. And one of the things that was also mentioned, we were starting a project to address the uh, requirements of the accessibility settlement. Um, the, from an IT perspective, there was basically two deadlines that we had to meet in terms of compliance of our website content, uh, one for this December, one for next. Uh, most, we're in very good shape for the, what the requirements of this December. Uh, for next December, uh, we're currently there's, there's two major two major pieces for us is is we need to uh, rewrite or modify both the voter lookup and the election night reporting uh, sites or um, pages uh, to be compliant accessible <coughs> compliant accessibility with accessibility guidelines um, we're currently looking at what that takes is, is going to take to do in terms of effort and requirements we have incorporated into the budget request uh, HBIS contracting staff to assist in that effort. We're also uh, enumerating all the current PDF uh, files that are on our website. The, uh, a lot of those are not compliant. Many have been brought into compliance, but others uh, still need to be done. We're currently enumerating those and expect to uh, contract out for remediation of those documents. Um, to, to meet the uh, December deadline. In terms of security, again, I think much of this is, has been mentioned by others. Uh, we continue to work with the county boards and our other partners in planning the upcoming election and contingency planning. Uh, specifically, we've been uh, collecting <coughs> from one of the things we encountered during the primary uh, was two of the counties had issues with their internet providers going down and losing service. Um, in the evening during reporting time. 
Uh, both counties had difficulty getting those internet providers to dispatch anyone or address those issues. Uh, so one of the things we work, we're working with, with uh, state homeland security and then through uh, public service commission is to collect the internet providers used by each of the county and county boards uh, so we can pre uh, develop a uh, master list of emergency contacts so we can get priority if needed on election night uh, from any of those service providers. Um, <coughs> I, IT as well as every, uh, most other areas of BOE continue working on implementation of the Staffing Secure Election Center. Um, I think we've gone, we've gone through all, all the efforts that, that that center is doing through the risk assessments, intrusion detection, managed security services. Uh, key point uh, for us is we've identified um, We've interviewed several people to, as the chief security information security officer, to oversee uh, those centers' efforts for cybersecurity for end-to-end -end inf elections infrastructure, and we have made an offer, and he has accepted. Um, we will. We are going through um, steps now to to finalize that appointment. Um, we've also begun uh, discussions with the Center for Technology and Government (CTG) on some longer-term efforts. Uh, for cybersecurity, including analysis of nice voter data, uh, looking for abnormalities as they as it comes in from county boards, either uh, establish to establish baselines of what normal nice voter traffic would look like, and then be able to look for and identify abnormalities in terms of increased volume, or changes in key data elements and things like that that would be indicative of uh, some kind of issue in the county. As, as, as it is right now, our view into the county really stops at our VPN or our, our physical connection to them. Um, this would give us some insight into possible abnormalities and if, if something occurred at uh, voter registration in, this, in the counties. Um, we're looking with them to examine some of the options in that regard. Not unlike uh, what credit card companies use uh, particular customers when they see things out of, out of the ordinary Per, on, a, on a per customer basis um, and be able to identify those. Um, we also participate in the security elections with the Nice Glitta conference, the, the state uh, IT directors that uh, Tom mentioned, basically is an update of our, our efforts uh, with the county boards and the risk assessments and what's, what we're working on, what's coming. Um, in terms of website, Analytics, uh, traffic to the website, and including voter lookup, approximately doubled during the month of September uh, related to the primary. Uh, I don't yet have figures uh, for October. I know the main website is settled back down to normal, but I, I'm expecting increased traffic for voter lookup, and we'll report that next time, and post-election as well. When you say voter lookup, do you mean voters looking up their registration status? Correct, yep, and poll site information. And poll site information. So this isn't people looking at campaign finance. You're talking about specifically voters right. looking well, at their... We break it down into three. One's the main website, which includes most of the campaign finance and the uh, general information, voter lookup, and then usually uh, right around the election we'll report stats on election night reporting site. That's only brought up during that time. Um, so overall traffic to our main website, as well as voter lookup, did double uh, during September. They generally go through the main website to get to the voter lookup, that's that traffic. Um, and, um, yeah. I would expect you would see a spike leading up to the October 12th voter registration deadline and then maybe again after the letter went out in New York City. Mm. And generally as the election approaches, we should see Right, then people are looking Increase for the full site well, Correct, yeah. right. Yeah. And we actually monitor traffic, real-time traffic, to all of those sites on election night. Um, and it's very interesting to watch. It will, you know, ramp up a voter lookup, and it'll cut, you know, uh, right up until midday or late day, and almost almost completely drops off, and then the ENR ramps up, and it's, it's a very it's very interesting to watch well, the traffic. Way, real -time. It's very busy from Sunday through actually close the polls on election day. So if you follow those, um, we also follow if it's mobile or, or tablet or uh, desktop, desktop kind of system. Um, 
just to see what kind of people are using the system. But we do monitor it to see, you know, how it's, you make sure it's working and that there aren't any issues. Uh, we have a number of people look at the sites throughout early in the morning throughout the day to make sure that nobody's hacked in and has put misinformation on our site. Um, and then, of course, there, we have a number of electronic and manual redundant um, emergency procedures if something should happen to our site. Um, other than saying that, we normally don't like to go into details in public as to what those are um, so that somebody doesn't go and hack those too. Um, <laughs> Um, but we, we, we ramp that up usually around um, when the, when the, you know, twice a day, uh, making sure that all of our state and federal security people and us, uh, you know, make sure that we follow what are, what are we hearing, what are we seeing, is there anything else that needs to be done, and that will start uh, next, uh, next Thursday. Next Thursday. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you. And our last unit is uh, enforcement. Risa Sugarman. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I was just, as I have done in previous uh, meetings, just um, going to ask you if you have questions for me. Anything new in your unit? Well, we are working um, on our investigations, and we um, receive emails and phone calls about um, people inquiring on who has filed or who has not filed their campaign finance, um, and we respond to those questions. Um, contact those committees if they have not filed and suggest to them that they do. Most of the time they come into compliance. Any other questions? I just would. Go ahead. Um, we have made a request through Bob and Todd for a, um, an IT um, a mass automated email, mass automated email, um, to start um, looking towards the um, the the filing of or the 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 contact of the committees that have not been fought that that are non filers um, one of the things that we did when we met with IT in terms of what I now know is a business rule I learned that since I've been here um, to um, have the um, computer system um, in the new system be responsive to our request for sending out um, contact with committees to generate reports. We asked for the ability to um, send out mass automated or from automated IT for automated messages, which would include people who have not filed um, their reports. Um, we don't have that ability in this system at this time. So um, looking at the regulations that were passed and the request um, that a 14108 letter be sent out, which is the five, what used to be referred to as the five-day letter, we've asked that um, IT create um, a automated email to those committees and candidates and treasurers who have email addresses indicating to them that they have um, failed to file their campaign reports and what should be done um, in response to that um, failure. Those letters on the periodics would be sent per our request 20, I believe it's 20 days let me just make sure. Um, I think it's 20 days after the, the report is due, and the election cycle reports would be sent one day after the report is due. And if there are no emails on the re in, in, in the record of the, of the board, that we be given a list of those 
committees, candidates, and treasurers that don't have emails so that we can send letters out. And this way we could try um, first to notify those committees that don't have, um, that have not filed their, their campaign finance disclosure reports. I we mentioned, can mention 2,500 reports, um, committees are not, um, did not file. That number includes the, the breakdown of approximately 1,500 C filers, local filers. Uh, no, 2,000, just let me, let me get it. 1,935 are C filers and 565 are A filers. So the majority of the, the filers are local filers, town council, highway supervisors, um, county executives, committees like that. I'm sh I know that you know that. When I looked at the numbers today, I just took a, a quick look at six of those committees, both A filers and C filers. And all of those committees that I found, one committee filed all of their, the, the candidate filed all of their election cycle files, lost the primary, and stopped filing. One candidate has been filing since they registered in 2007, I believe, has been trying to um, terminate since 2016. And the reason that the termination was denied was because there was no um, loan document filed for a loan some 15 or 20 years ago. All the reports have been updated, all of the forgiveness of the loans have been submitted, but the loan document itself, which is about 20 years old, has not been filed. So the termination was denied. So instead of filing a no activity report for several years, the treasurer stopped filing. Several other candidates either did not get on the ballot and st stopped filing, or again, closed, lost the, the election, filed what would be termed a final report because the zero balance of their final report and then stop filing. And the reason that I bring this up is because when you file under 3-104, uh, in the hearing officer, it would be required to create a hearing officer report that said, number one, there was a substantial reason to believe that there was a violation of law, that the, whether or not the case should be filed, settled extrajudicially, whether or not a special proceeding should be filed. Those are three requirements. And in order to avoid dismissal, that the violation was not de minimis, whether or not the committee had attempted to come into compliance, and whether or not there were prior violations of this particular committee, candidate, or treasurer. So when you're looking at, and, and this is just a, you know six out of many, many committees, but my sense is that a majority of those committees, especially those that are newly registered, or the ones that are old and have several judgments. When you, when, when you file a hearing officer 
you would have to establish that all of those things and then to avoid dismissal, prove that the violation was not de minimis. And if there's one missed filing for a candidate who ran, closed their committee, got a zero balance, filed all their reports until they got a zero balance, and then just did not file again, or just registered and didn't get enough signatures to get on their ballot and then stopped filing. The allegation that this violation was not de minimis would not be possible. Oh, now, the, the, the next requirement, and, and what makes it even more difficult, is that after going through a hearing officer, the hearing officer does not have the ability to impose penalties. So that the Supreme Court petition must be filed again. So when we look at all of these cases, what, what we do is try to determine whether or not there is the, um, the ability to go forward on these matters where you have committees in the situations like I've described. And what we're going to try to do is to present to you the guidelines that I've just described and how many of those committees fall within those guidelines to show you that a, a, a number of 2,500 non-filers is not a number that translates into 2,500 cases or 2,500 hearing officer cases that should be brought. So you're going to do that analysis? Right. Well, that's what the analysis that we do. And perhaps I have been, not perhaps, I, 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 I have done that analysis. What we try to do is to bring those committees into compliance that, um, that are in these situations. It's hard because we don't have the ability to, you know, the, and uh, you, you sit here. You know, every this is, I, I'm listening to this as, as you filibuster away. Um, <laughs> the, the unit before your unit was set up, had only a tiny fraction of the budget. Um, uh, essentially, it was four people working part time to accomplish this. And they did, they dealt, they processed um, uh, many hundreds and sometimes thousands, over a thousand. Uh, uh, of these committee um, non-filings. And all you need to do is tell us what the standards are and report back on a list that can be a short phrase, reporting back to the compliance unit and saying, I'm not prosecuting this committee because uh, uh, an old loan was not filed 15 years ago. One sentence. And just report it back. Um, uh, apparently, you're now taking the position that if a candidate loses the primary, you're not going to take enforcement action against them. Commissioner the Kellner, standard, I did not say that. Well, I Don't got put that words in my mouth. I've been trying to sit here and trying very calmly, you sit and look at me. Because you're I, not doing your job, Risa. I'm going to tell you straight out. You are not doing the job that was set up for you. And I've been here for 12 years. Your predecessors, before your office was set up, I gave them a hard time, but they did substantially more in terms of the routine enforcement 
than your office does, even though your office has six times the budget. And the, and pro the process that was in place, sir, before 3-104 was passed was light years different. There was no requirement that a spe fact specific, and that's what I, you know, whether or not you choose to listen to me, excuse to me, Take can I finish? And mark it up. Can I, I finish? You, you just went for 15 minutes. And all I'm asking you to do is take the list that compliance gives you and mark it up and say, here's what I've done with each of your things. It only has to be a sentence, but just mark it up so that, so that compliance knows what you're interested in, so we know what you're interested in, and so most significantly, the public knows what the process is. Can I, can I finish? I mean, I, I am trying to, and I have been over the past four years, explain that pushing a button and filing a petition is not what happens now. I, I, I don't know how better to explain it. I am not going to give you a list. I am going to try to fulfill my obligations under the statute. I, I, I just tried to explain to you, but I, I, I guess, I don't know whether it's the decibel of my voice. You can't do things the way you used to do things. I don't know what the problem is that you don't understand that. I do understand it. No, right you now, obviously there is no don't. No uniform and transparent process because you will not communicate with us what those standards are. You have not indicated why you won't proceed with the. E even you yourself admit that that um, you claim maybe half of the list of referrals that you get to are not cases that are worthy of prosecution. Okay, I get it. And I probably agree with it. I, I don't but, know what you're talking about. But, I, I don't understand what you, are you talking about the deficiency referrals? Are you talking about failing to file referrals? Uh, right now we're talking about failure to file because I understand with deficiency that with one exception out of the thousands of deficiency referrals that you have been given, you have not brought a single deficiency case. But, but, but with non-filers, you've brought 20. I think we're up to four this year. Four out of how many non-filers have been referred to Reese's unit this year? Um, Is it 2,000? 2,500. -ish. Yeah, and four. With well, no explanation talking, me, of how these four about... were chosen and why all the other people who have similar profiles of non-filing have not been prosecuted. If you're talking about the hearing officer cases, the hearing officer cases are not limited to non-filers. So uh, that's, that's a, that, that I, don't, I don't know how you make that referent. But when it's more important to me to get people into compliance if I can. And it seems, when I read the law, that in order to avoid a dismissal because a hearing officer finds that the, the, we can't allege that the, the committee did not try in good faith to come into compliance, that that's part of the th process I have to go through to bring a hearing officer case. So are you saying, Risa, that for, night, for 2018, where you received, I guess, 2,500 committees were referred to you from the July report, and I'm going to presume that probably another 2,500 re were referred to from the January Well, report, I don't know so. that it's another. You can well, say it's another. Okay. It might be the same committees. Well, th but, that's, but it's, a, that's it's, it's, it's still a separate referral because it's a separate filing. But so let's just, hold on. Let's just take this example. Those are only two of the filings. 
that were required this year. There were other filings required, but let's just take those two. Let's assume for a minute that the number is somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 referrals for those two filings, because based on the last one, I think that's a fair assumption. You're saying that out of that, you analyzed those I, and concluded that only two or three were worthy no, that's of... that's not what I'm saying. I'm, okay, so what are you saying? I'm just, re, I'm are, trying to explain to you the process that I go, uh, no, that I go through. Right, and I'm trying to understand it. So you're telling me you've gone through this process of analyzing these failures to file and concluded that there's only two or three of those thousands that deserve the attention of a hearing officer. The other 4,998 are so de minimis that they don't even deserve That's a hearing not officer. What I'm saying. And so not what are you saying? And, I guess what and you're, you're not telling us why. In other words, all you have to do is take the list and tell us. And if you want it to be confidential, I'll swallow hard and say if that's what it takes to get you to tell us what's going on, to keep it confidential, fine. But, but uh, well, we'll see. But, uh, but, but, but the point is, is that you're not giving any feedback that shows anybody that there's an analysis going on. Yeah, by the and, way, I'm not sure why that would be confidential, Commissioner. I mean, these lists are well, public. It should, and it these should, public hearings are public. These public hearings are public. The public has a right I to agree. know why Did this I committee... Did I say that was confidential? No, 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 no. He just raised it, and I just wanted to respond that well, I think... Well, all I know is that you refuse to communicate that information to us. And, and the compliance unit could do a better job if they knew what the standards were. Um, but... but I, I, I don't I still don't understand what the compliance unit are you telling me that that they would take those names off of, of a non filer list I, yeah. I don't understand to that. some extent that's true for example you know you have um, you have given us information um, half a dozen or so times and said this particular committee should be terminated notwithstanding and we have done that and if you identified the committee if you have, well, if you don't like my word, I'm sorry, but this committee should be terminated because of whatever the reason. And we have done that. In fact, we have not, on any occasion that you've asked or suggested that the committee be terminated, not actually done so, and, and almost in real time. And so if you identified that we have a committee that's on the list, and the only reason it's there is because it has a 15-year-old letter of indebtedness that hasn't been returned, if you actually identified that committee to us, you would be surprised what we would be able to do. Similar to what we did with the deficiencies. We met, you said, we don't think this range is good. We adjusted our range. We don't think these things should be referred over. We adjusted the, the fact pattern. We take your input and we adjust accordingly to the best that we can. Commissioner Kellner's suggestion that an annotated list come back to us would be an incredibly useful tool. So that's our response. I think we are frustrated that we feel that there is no idea on this side as to what your standards are. My to standards make a are what the law is, Commissioner. That's no, all not. I can say. They're not. Yes, they I are. Could, I could yes, take, they are. I could take 20 cases, really? randomly pull them off the list, and I'll show you that you have not followed up on okay. some of those cases. And we'll the problem on. is That's is kidding. that it's arbitrary and capricious as to who actually gets prosecuted now, nobody knows. And if it's not arbitrary, well, I mean, I could take out of the 20 hearing officer cases you've brought, there's an incredibly disproportionate number of minorities who are the respondents in those cases, oh okay? I'm not suggesting Then why that did that's you bring why. it up? I brought sir. it up because you will not disclose the criteria on shame how on these you. people were selected. Shame on you for even bringing that up. Oh no, it's shame on you for the fact of not realizing <laughs> that that you're almost four times as likely to be prosecuted in a hearing officer case if you're black or Hispanic. And look at the data. But but Risa you won't disclose what the standards are. I'm not saying that you went after them because they're black or Hispanic. I'm saying that if you look at the 20 cases you've brought, it's highly disproportionate. 
but you won't tell us what the standards are. Why this non-filer got prosecuted, but that other non-filer who appears to the public to be similarly situated has not been prosecuted. I mean, that's the problem. There's no transparency. There's no appearance of uniformity. And certainly from our point of view, the number of cases who are get, get prosecuted. And now, I hear you suggesting that unless you get, suggesting that you need an automated process for sending out the notices that on a fraction of the budget had been sent out manually before your office was created. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't do it if it's something, if it's a process that's feasible to be done, but it's not an excuse for not getting the notices out. Well, I, I just found the request. I mean, Risa just gave it to us, I think, last, I have to pick the date, maybe last Tuesday. So we certainly we got it and we're looking at it. I, I believe it was a week ago. I might be off this by a few day days. the day you sent the non-filer list. Right, but it was like within the well, last so the week. the day so. you sent the non-filer list. It was in the last week. Right. Okay, well. So, so certainly that came to us. It's, it, but I also think you've heard um, uh, over a number of months. 926. Um, Mr. The day you Cross's uh, description of the technology projects he's already working on and and if, if a technology project goes in queue, what it takes to complete one, so. And in the meantime, it should go out manually. Well, it, it, just like it. And if the list was accurate, maybe it, I would. Just like everything else. Tell us where the just list is. Like I don't out. know where the list is. For example, if a, if a county committee, a C Taylor, Files a CF20 locally. I don't know that, and I can't. I can't get that information, and in lieu of, I can't get that information from the state board. But you're asking me to send a litigation letter to those committees. I don't think that's appropriate. You might practice law that way. Well, I us, don't. If that's the case, tell us. Tell us if those are if the, if that's the case of those committees. If, the, if that's I, I don't know those committees. I don't know if the fifteen hundred and nineteen hundred and thirty five C filers. How many of those filed in their counties, and in lieu of? I don't know. You don't know. But you want Is me that to say correct defense for prosecution. This is the first time I'm here. Well, we're not, not considering that her jurisdiction includes the counties, and she could ask the counties. I mean, we, we only met this week uh, at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. Well, we could also ask Wednesday. Well, I'll tell you what we'll Wednesday, do. We'll take the last those, list and we'll are. annotate it, and we'll see just how what, what the list looks like. That would be helpful. We'll do it. That would be helpful. And we'll show her, uh, Risa, where her stats really are and how many... I'm sorry, Kim, annotate it in what way? Just like, like, like Commissioner Keller is asking her to do and has asked people to do. You mean and the staff they don't have that specific So we'll take committee. our staff that's on 100,000 reviews and we'll put them on it and we'll have them annotate it and we'll see maybe, and Brian is now looking at me and they're all freaking out. No, no, it's, it's, it's not no. the work. It's, but, but the issue is annotated to what standard? And the point is... The annotation serves to <laughs> so say. Losing a primary I is think, not something we're going to take people off the list. Uh, and then, for. And then what, what yeah, the I'm answer? astounded that Ms. Sugarman thinks that that's a reason not to pr proceed. Well, actually, I'm not astounded, um, but but um, that's my problem: is that we have an enforcement council who's basically saying, "I'm not going to issue parking tickets. I'm not going to do anything if." And really, the five-day letter, I think, um, clears a lot of those things up. If they're okay. sent out, the people call and right. say, no, I filed right. a CF-20. No, I, I, and, I forgot about yeah, that. And the, I, and the five-day letter I always the went out. Idea, if it doesn't over, over tax the staff. It doesn't even matter. I would like we'll to, just have I to, would we'll like just to do see it. that. Annotate it any way I'm you want based them. on what you think, and just let's take a look at it. We'll take a look at it. I mean, instead of, I'm, I'm listening back and forth. This I hear you. This has been you. going on for I three don't. years now. I agree. I don't want to hear it. I'm with you. 
So you're going to take the last the 2,500 names from the July file and, and do this? And incredibly, she picked six, and they were all faulty. So we'll see what the well, other... They weren't all faulty. She said that... Well, they... She's telling me now that, that she does not regard that losing, losing a primary is a reason for non-filing. What I'm telling you, or what I tried to tell you, is what the legal requirements will be on a hearing officer case. I get it. And then going to Supreme Court. That's what I'm trying to I get tell it. you. And just annotate back and say, in this case, I don't think I can meet the standard because of blank. That's all. It's not hard. You took the time to look at the file. You should at least make a note of what your decision was and why and tell us. And that's all. We I've would, been asking for that I, from yeah, the I beginning. Did, I did. You have the right, right to, to uh, close a file. It's not, you know, a strict liability doesn't mean that you don't need sure, evidence. And it doesn't mean you have to disprove a de minimis I know statute. It is. I was a prosecutor too. Right. Well, then that's a, that's that statement has no value. Well, just give in us this a discussion. sentence. Well, tell I, us what you found. If you looked at six of them, done. tell us what you found on those six. Why you closed it? Why don't we it? just try this? See if it opens up right. another another avenue of discussion. I mean, maybe we'll find a way where we can like make this. our list better. Our teacher. Yeah. Well, I want staff. you to do that. That's right. Maybe it'll be a productive exercise. Well, we, we've tried that for four years, and it's always been a one-way street. Well, well, Except well, in very limited areas. So, I am the bridge so, here. So, I will, I will um, help. So as long as those, and it has been helpful when we've sat down with Risa or her staff, <laughs> where she has identified these are clearly de minimis, so we stop setting them for. So right. anything that can help in that regard, we don't want to send her things that she's identified as de minimis, which I think under the statute is her authority to do. Well, I have to imagine in four and then we'll stop years, there's been more than So 20. instead of arguing over 2,500, we'll argue over 632. Whatever it is, we'll focus on what we really need to focus on. And, okay. And the five-day letter, make it clear that that, on how there's it's going to get out, numbers. that it's not dependent on waiting for a computer file. No, we have the numbers of how, how the number of failure files decrease markedly. Well, 50, 60% once, five once day the five-day letters, letters go computer. out. We'll bring all that to the next, email system. I guess. Okay. And they've sent out emails without a computer system. so. So Emails I'll work around required. can happen in the meantime. No, but I, I, I think, you know, it, it just adds something else to the mix that we can take a look okay. at and maybe get a different perspective. Good. I'm sorry, Brian. I'm confused. <laughs> okay. That's normal, but I mean... I think that would be helpful. <laughs> okay. Do we have anything else on this? Okay. Then that completes the uh, unit updates. And we will move on now to old business. Okay. And we have two items under old business. And the first item is an opinion regarding child care. And I know this came up uh, a couple meetings ago as a proposal to revisit the issue of uh, using campaign money for child care, which I think was visited in 1990. And an opinion was issued which allowed the use of campaign money under rather uh, Narrow circumstances where basically both parents were out of the house based on a campaign event. Uh, but since that time, there has been, I know, an FEC opinion which uh, was issued earlier this year, which allowed for a congressional candidate to use campaign money at, at the federal level for uh, child care purposes under a specific set of circumstances. And there have been, I know, some requests here, apparently, for a similar type of uh, opinion to be issued. Uh, we don't have a specific request, which I know has caused some problems here trying to get an opinion out, because normally we respond to a specific set of facts. In this case, we don't have that. Uh, what we have is just a general issue of whether or not campaign money uh, should be eligible to be used for uh, child care purposes and under what circumstances. So there's an opinion here that's been drafted by the staff. It's before us. Uh, this one, I'm not going to read it, but this one I think uh, goes to the specific question. In fact, the specific question asked is, may a candidate for public office or party position use campaign funds to pay for child care services? Uh, there's a general discussion about that and what the state of the law is. And the conclusion reached is that it can be used 
if the expenses are a direct result of the guardian's participation in a campaign activity. Um, I think this is similar, frankly, to the opinion we put out in 1990. I think it goes along the same lines. I think it's a somewhat more expansive because it doesn't limit it to the situation where both parents have to be at a campaign event, but there would have to be a direct relationship between the need for child care services and the campaign itself. Um, so that's, that's my summary of what's here. If you want to talk, talk about anything. I don't think it's unreasonable. If, if, if you have anything specific you want to speak to, I don't know if anybody I, else. I uh, move the adoption of uh, today's draft, which is a slight revision from the draft that's been posted uh, uh, on our website. Um, we have gotten many favorable comments to the draft that was posted on the website, um, uh, but uh, I think this uh, uh, th this version uh, moves the ball forward and uh, would be helpful to the public and uh, is certainly consistent with what was posted and um, received public comment. So I'll, I'll make that motion. I'll second that, and I'd like to uh, just add that uh, for those who, have, who, have, who are running for office, who have campaign committees, uh, as, as, some, <coughs> excuse me, as someone who has run uh, 12 times in my lifetime, um, it's very important, I think, that the, la the very last paragraph, any person requiring guidance on whether an expenditure is a personal use given certain circumstances may request an opinion pursuant to election law 14-130. That's very important and I think anybody that has a running for office and, and, and in a, especially in, the, in, in, in an instance where full disclosure is very very important don't rely necessarily on your treasurer to tell you this is something that you really have to look at uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an elected official or going to be an elected official hey we need an opinion. Let's clear it with the Board of Elections first so that they have, the, they have a written opinion, understanding exactly what the circumstances are, because they do change with, the, with variations, and they should understand that these are the rules of the game, this is what I'm going to play by, and, and they're a lot safer that way than taking a guess. Yes. Are there any other comments? Uh, there's been a motion on the floor to adopt and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So it is adopted. In that form, <clears throat> and that also, I might add, um, rescinded, I believe, opinion 90, from 1990. Uh, 90 right, because it removed the limitations. So it yeah. uh, supplants that in essence. So that should be put up as a new opinion on that topic. <coughs> All right. Our second issue of old business is the adoption of the independent expenditure rule that we put out earlier this year pursuant to the new statute and it's uh, a uh, an amendment to part 6200 of our rules and regulations uh, there was a slight change to the one that was put out there a couple was, months ago there was a slight change all the changes are on page seven regarding uh, mag applicability of this to magazines uh, Nick called up um, the regulators of these uh, regulations, and it doesn't require it to go out for comment. It wasn't a change substantial enough to require additional comment period. And uh, as you can see, Nick did a wonderful job in explaining all the comments that we received and answering them. And right up until last week, we were still talking to the groups, and uh, I think we... So what was we, the change? Exactly. Just it now exempts magazines. Okay, it added magazines to the exempt. Right. right. Okay. And... Uh, Right up to last week, we were still talking with people. I think I think it came out pretty well. Nick did most of the work. So, and magazines are referred to as periodicals. Yeah, term that's right. And yeah, and it links it to a specific tax uh, statute, so people know it. what exactly, exactly we're talking about. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So this would be final adoption now. These it would rules be. and regs, right? That were that were put out earlier as emergency. I move we adopt. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. And it's seconded. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? All right. Aye. Opposed? So those are adopted as well. Okay. So that concludes old business for today, unless there's any other old business to come up before the board. Not seeing any, we will move on to new business. And we have actually three issues under new business. Uh, the first one is the Dominion voting system. This is a uh, 
and I'll let maybe someone at the staff level explain it, but this is a new voting system that's been uh, has been uh, submitted for testing here at the State Board. Uh, this is now here for final approval, and I know it's gone through all the necessary systems checks to make sure that it works properly. I understand some met all those and that this is now a uh, proposal to approve this for sale uh, in New York State. So is there any discussion about this? Does someone at the staff level want to talk about this more, Brendan or uh, The only thing Tom? I would just state is it's actually not a new system itself. It's an upgrade to the existing system. Okay. Um, it was a hardware and a firmware change to the, the, the kind of base uh, software, which is the election management system, is unchanged. Um, so this is newer hardware. Uh, this is, uh, we did go through all the different testing that we're required to do to make sure that it uh, meets all of the requirements, both on the federal and state level. Uh, we've included copies of the various reports that were a result of that testing. And with the, along with the resolution, there's actually two resolutions. One is a resolution certifying the upgrade to the system, right. and one is a directive on the use of that system for counties. Um, the, the need for that second resolution largely has to do with the fact that the configuration of the hardware as it was submitted to us for certification um, only allows the machine to act as either an optical scanner or a ballot marking device at one time and not concurrently. So therefore, as opposed to the systems that we have in the poll sites now where someone can use a ballot marking device while scanning is going on at the same time, since this current configuration doesn't allow that, um, the directive takes that into consideration and changes some of the numbers as far as uh, how many machines would have to be deployed based on how many voters are in a, a polling place. Brendan, do you have anything? No, that's it. So, um, <coughs> um, Tom, uh, as part of our certification process, we uh, uh, require uh, uh, two outside authorities to work with your staff in making those reviews and um, would you explain uh, uh, the roles of each of them uh, in this particular? Sure, so SysTest Sys Labs, otherwise known as SLI, um, does a number of different reviews for us. In this situation they did a security review, uh, a review of the technical data package or the TTP, um, and also uh, in a source code review of the system. Um, we also use NYSTEC, uh, the New York State Technology Enterprise Corporation, uh, as a kind of second set of eyes. Uh, they looked at the security review that SLI did, and they also looked at the functional testing that the State Board staff did. Now, in the uh, NYSTEC report, in part five of the report on their findings and observations, um, they um, uh, reviewed the issue of the ports that are contained on the machine um, uh, and uh, uh, would you explain the function of the USB ports that are on the ICE machine which is also the case for the Dominion image cast that it's upgrading and and also comparable sure. to the SNS DS200. Right, so there are a number of ports that are a part of any of these voting systems that we use, uh, and the image cast evolution is no different. Um, there are both an RG45 or otherwise what might be known as an Ethernet port, which you might normally see for connecting computer cables to, and there's also a USB port, uh, which is used for a secondary monitor, which is not part of the configuration that we're certifying. Um, but as part of our functional testing of the machine, we made sure that neither one of these ports uh, could be used for any sort of networking or, um, or connections since that's forbidden by our, our regulations. Uh, we did a number of different tests in the statute, which are normally negative tests because we plug different things into it to make sure that it doesn't get recognized or no link light comes on. Um, those tests were in, uh, included in our testing and they did all pass. Uh, there is no modem hardware in, within the machine itself. Um, and there's no ability to enable that from within the system on the machine. So based on the NYSTEC study, we can conclude that these machines do um, lack any capability for wireless or internet communication. Correct, and for the most part, their recommendations as to uh, placing tamper evidence seals 
on some of those ports, and there's also a smart card reader in the front, which isn't used in our configuration, is, is largely um, cosmetic. And, um, and so uh, the, it, the recommendations that are made in part five of the NICE Tech report, um, would you explain how they will actually be implemented? Well, first, can you confirm that, uh, that the state board adopts those recommendations and that the counties will have to comply with them? Right. So we have, um, we, we have drafted a procedure for seal placement on the Dominion ICE machine, which includes the, the recommendations from the NYSEC report. So the ports on the side of the unit, as well as a smart card uh, reader in the front of the unit. Uh, as part of our acceptance testing, if a county opts to buy this machine, uh, state board staff will be on site when it gets received, and we would obviously review with them the, um, the seal placement procedure that we've written up. And then we also hope to, generally speaking, um, kind of just review that with county boards as we go out more and more for our board visits. And how do we know that the software that's actually installed in any particular machine is only the certified software? Uh, well, because, well, A, it's required, but also we, we, we are the only source of that software for the counties. Uh, and so we have kind of an escrowed copy of the software that's been certified, and that's the only uh, part that's allowed to. And we also do hash checks upon the installation of that software. So, so if somebody got a hold of an uncertified version of the software and somehow or other was able to get it in the machine, and I'm talking about an insider, really, um, the hash check codes would alert the fact that uncertified software was being used. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Now, uh, in the uh, uh, Nice Tech report, um, they um, uh, provided uh, for uh, a protocol. Uh, it says that. Um, Um, it, it says that if there is a, uh, a, a breach of a, a seal through any of these ports, that it should be reported on the incident log. Would you explain that procedure and how the State Board monitors county compliance with the procedure? So um, the Security Incident Response Procedure um, is a document that we had created, and it's, it's uh, in use for the current systems as well. It would be unchanged for if we were to certify the Dominion I system. It has to do with what does a county board do in case of a, a, you know, a, a seal is broken or there's some sort of tampering that's evident. Um, there's a number of different requirements that are put on the county board as far as designating people. Uh, they have an election, security, uh, election system security officers. They're supposed to be a bipartisan team. Um, they're supposed to obviously read and be aware of all the things that are required. They're supposed to fill out a form um, when something happens and that has a number of different details in it as far as the, the mode or what kind of stage of the process we're in, whether it's pre-election or election day or post-election. Um, they're supposed to generate uh, reports. They're supposed to provide copies of that to the state board. They're supposed to alert of us to the incident and also how it was uh, mitigated on their end. As far as how we would uh, be checking in on those things going forward. I think, as I was saying before, in addition to not just the seal placement, and as kind of part of our increased focus on security, not just cybersecurity, as part of our board visits, I think we, Brendan and I, have discussed kind of beefing up um, some of the things that we do to make sure that it's not just a matter of, yeah, they're aware of the security incident response form, but you know, asking them the questions like, who are your two SOs, and who, you know. Can you show us any documentation that you've done? So that we're visiting boards on a, on a frequent basis and ensuring that they're not just in possession of, of the procedure, but actually utilizing it. And then uh, finally, uh, uh, turning to the resolution on the uh, uh, number of machines uh, required in order to comply with uh, 621019, which is essentially designed to enforce the board's policy that uh, uh, voters should not have to wait uh, an excessive amount of time in, uh, at the poll site to cast their vote. Uh, so, uh, would you want to? Would you briefly explain uh, how it is that you determined uh, that there should be uh, the numbers that are set forth in the proposed resolution? 
Sure. So obviously, 621019B um, says that for every optical scanner, uh, you deploy one for every 4,000 voters. Uh, if you take that into a 15 hour election day, it works out to about 13 and a half seconds for each voter. Uh, based on the usability study that Dominion did, it took about 491 seconds, I believe, for a person who was utilizing the device as a ballot marking device. Um, so basically, we asked NICE Tech to look at all the data that we had, and including data that we've collected from county boards as far as how many individuals have utilized um, the ballot marking devices in their county. And we took the highest number from, I believe, 2016, which was Monroe County, which had 34 individuals using that. And basically, we took the 34 individuals, we multiplied it by the 491 seconds, came up with an amount of time and said, well, how many voters just using the scanner would that kind of displace? And so after taking that number, subtracting it from the 4,000, and then rounding down to the nearest 100 just to be safe, we ended up with 2,700 voters. And, uh, and so the goal here is to make sure that if there is um, significant usage of the device as a ballot marking device, it's not going to prevent other voters in the poll site from submitting their ballots to a, a scanner. Correct. All right. So on that basis, I appreciate the answers to all those questions. Um, uh, I move the adoption of both resolutions, both certifying the machine and setting forth the directive on the number of machines required. Okay, before I, before I entertain a motion, I have a question I want to sure, understand sorry. myself. That's okay. So I'm going to go back to this number that you, that you were just talking about with Commissioner Kellner. And I'm reading, I'm reading the uh, resolution as presented. So there's two resolutions, as mentioned, and one would adopt the ICE machine as a certified machine. The second is this directive, I guess we're calling it, about usage. So as you explained, you, you, you looked at the number of uh, voters attached to a current Dominion machine, which was 4,000, based on this analysis you identified. And then went through, I, I guess, this process with Monroe County and came up with this 2,700 number. So I guess that's based on how long it takes a disabled voter to use this ICE machine and subtract that from the 4,000 and, and it came up with 2,700. Now the resolution uh, has two therefore, has two resolves. And one is that, that you cannot assign an ICE machine to serve more than 2,700 registered voters, which, which you um, explained. And then the second resolve says that if a single ICE machine is assigned, well, actually to a poll number of 2,700 or less, then there must be two scanners. So I'm trying to understand, you know, the concept there. My, under, you know, my understanding is you've, you've, you've accommodated this process where this ICE machine services both disabled and non-disabled people simultaneously. And I understand that's the problem that's different from the current situation where the BMD is separate from the scanner. So now you've got the BMD and the scanner basically together. And so you had to reduce the number of voters attached to it because of the usage of it by the disabled community. And that will then prohibit others from scanning during that time period. So you reduce the number, fair enough. But then in B you say, but if, you're, if your total number assigned is 2,700 or less, you still have to put a, a whole other scanner in that poll site. Only if more than two, two, two voters, two, two, two disabled but, voters have but, used that machine in the, the past. But think about the problem. Okay. If, so the average time for somebody to use a BMD is eight minutes and 41 seconds? Was that? Was, uh, well, 491 seconds, so I'm not entirely sure how that works out. To, yeah, eight minutes, more than okay. eight minutes. Okay. And that's the average. So okay. that means sometimes it's going to be more than average. Okay. Now this is the only machine in the poll site. I got it. All right. Yep. So you're a voter now, right? Um, who's marked his ballot and wants to scan it. Right. You have to wait right. until that BMD user is finished. Right. Which is certainly something very few people have to wait to insert their ballot in a scanner now. Right. So that they're accustomed to just being able to yeah, fill it out, stick it in. Right. Suppose it's not eight minutes, but suppose it's 15 minutes. Okay. All right. Um, now you've got to wait 15 minutes behind that. Now we're saying that's tolerable twice a day. Okay. 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 But if it's more than two, 
then there comes a point where you got to have another BMD. Right. Um, um, as, as a way of not backing up the non-BMD users who will have to wait behind a BMD. But I, I, I mean, it just seems to me that, you know, we've accommodated the fact that they're going to be simultaneously used by reducing the number to 2,700. We're now accommodating it a second time. I mean, it, it just begs the question to me, why are we reducing the number assigned to the ICE machine if we're going to require a second machine there anyways? Oh, no. That, then the first part applies and the number is 3,900. But I'm saying, why, are we, why would we, why are we reducing the number assigned to the ICE machine if, in essence, if there's ever a disabled person who has to use it in that poll site, you're going to have to have a separate scanner in that poll site anyways. So what was the purpose of reducing the number assigned to the ICE machine if we're going to require all of our counties to have a second scanner at the poll site anyways? Aren't we, aren't we double counting the usage of these machines when we reduce the number once and still require you to add another scanner to that poll site? Right. I know Brian's chomping at the bit for me to defer to him. So. Oh, go ahead. I, whoever can uh, answer. The, um, the, the issue is that when you look back at the, that the use history of these machines, it is um, often the case that there would be no users. Uh, occasionally one users and in a very small number of instances would at the same election event you have two. And one of the issues in addition to the one that Commissioner Kellner identified that it deals with in terms of the acceptability of, the, of that kind of a delay between 9 and 15 minutes as an episode um, that B takes into account is, is the issue of in the first analysis you're, you're looking at the entire voting day and you're looking at the impact over that entire range. What B also takes into account is the non-time proportional problem that could occur. For example, if you have two BMD users come in back to back, um, and, um, and in which case you end up literally because a single BMD user takes up so much time in, com in comparison that you could literally, even if at average, um, you could have an 18 minute backup where two people came in at once. So my favorite philosopher is Ralph Waldo Emerson, who maybe perhaps is not really a philosopher, but he said the past instructs and the future invites. So what we did is we just said, look, if we have a history of use that is two or more, um, then we'll take into account the, the potential problem that could occur with the non-time proportional um, application. There is also a possibility, of course, that the, the past does not instruct. You know, that we could have an instance where, um, uh, where in a poll site that could only have one machine um, that never had a history of two voters coming, that that could actually occur. Um, but um, this is trying to make the solution fit the, the potential problem as, as best as possible. Uh, and, and hopefully, you know, ultimately when the machine is, uh, comes back for another round of certification, it'll have resolved the issue. So let me ask you this. What, what was the purpose of reducing the number to, to 2,700? The 2,700 takes into account <coughs> um, over the course of the entire 15-hour day the impact um, that, um, that someone coming into the poll site would cause the voting on the machine. You mean a, you mean a disabled person? Any person using the BMD. Okay, anybody, pers okay, so a person, so we've accommodated then the use of the BMD on the ICE machine by reducing the number to 2,700. In terms of its 15-hour capacity. Right. Yes. Right, but you've, you've, you've accommodated for that by yes. saying we're only, we're going to assign 1,300 fewer voters to that machine because we recognize there may come a time where someone wants to use the BMD portion of it, and that will then tie the machine up for a longer period of time than a non-disabled voter. And so we have to reduce the number of voters assigned to that machine. Right. Fair enough. But then you go on to say, yeah, but if you, but if you have a BMD user, you've got to have another scanner there anyways. But so I'm no, just talking, I'm having trouble. It doesn't say that. It says. Yeah, it does. It on the you, next you, page. You, you're accurate on the first, the first one, as far as I read it. And on the second one, it only applies to those polling places where there were two in the past. I got it. Okay. I got it. And got only it. one machine. Yeah, I got it. Only the, one marginal, machine. the marginal for a second machine is 3,900. Right. I got it. It just seems illogic. It just seems logic yeah, to me says you've already accommodated for this by reducing the number to 2,700. No, now you're no, now you're accommodating it again by adding another machine. You're accommodating only it if, twice. No, but the uh, the 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 second part is to take up the problem where 
you can't really accommodate for it because this election, this um, poll site has an unusual number of BMD voters. Two? Well, upstate, that's actually the case. There are very few election districts where there have been two more than two uh, BMD voters. I know, but I mean, if you but, do, but if but, you do the analysis, we need to protect for that. Fair enough, but but I mean, if you do the analysis of how these numbers were created in the first place, it was done thirty. The, the four thousand, as I understand it, was done based on a continuum of people coming in and spending thirteen seconds at the well, machine scanning their ballot. No, actually, that and that's how we came up with four thousand to begin with. Not right. Th that's way oversimplified. Um, first of all. There are 4,000 voters assigned to the poll site. It's rare when there's 100% voter turnout. So it also factors in the fact that there's the, okay. that the voter turnout. I think we've. I think the original numbers were done at 65%, which was okay. which is even okay. still high okay. for voter turnout. Okay. And 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 the mean time, but of course, um, uh, voters don't come in every 13 right. seconds. Right. So you also have to factor in um, uh, uh, heavy usage times. Mm -hmm. but, but, but as I'm sure you know, it doesn't take 13 seconds to scan a ballot. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's shorter than that. Mm -hmm. um, this number, A, is which, the, which number are you pointing uh, to? Um, for, for this particular machine, and I can't believe I'm the guy defending this because they had to talk me into this. <laughs> but, but, but because my, my, my initial starting point was um, if you're going to have a, if you're going to use it as a BMD, if you're going to, you if it's good, you needed two machines. Right. You couldn't just use one for both purposes right. because, uh, and B was the compromise to do that. But but the theory with A is that it's 3,900 is the ordinary usage for the machine if it's not going to be used as a BMD. But one machine in the poll site is required to be used as a BMD in order to meet HAVA requirements. Mm -hmm. And NYSTEC came up with that formula mm -hmm. So that for the first machine at a poll site, the threshold number is 2,700. And then it's 3,900 for each additional machine. And that's because one of those machines is at least theoretically set aside for BMD usage, which will reduce... So I could have a situation where I have a uh, poll site with 500 voters, mm -hmm. 200, two, two, uh, Use the BMD at the last election, mm -hmm. and now I have to have two machines. Yes, right. And, I, and what I would what I would pose to you. And the rationale for that is is this: is that the minute those two people came in, if they came in together, even though you only have 200 voters there, you've just created on average an 18-minute line. Mm -hmm. If it's not on average, average. You have, you, right. And if it's not average, perhaps that line could be a 40-minute line, um, automatically, just because of the history of how it's right. used. So it's the, it's that non-linear, not so it's linear, that non-proportional time uh, use issue. Um, is that you have an instant line even if you only have two people. So the, so the person who's third in line, um, even though we're only 200 people on the poll site, could be waiting 40 minutes. And as far as I'm concerned, the alternative is to require a second machine. Right. Um, in all that, circumstances. Yeah. And that B is the compromise to say, okay, in a small poll site where there's no historic usage of the BMD, then... Um, will we'll waive the requirement. And realistically, not ma that many poll sites, I would imagine, have one now. And these are new going into their fleet, so they already have a full fleet. So it wouldn't be a, a, that big of a burden on the county boards to have to. Well, why are they buying these machines? Why, why are county boards buying these want, nice machines? I have no idea. They want well, new machines. Uh, 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 are, they, are they replacing uh, what they've got, though? I mean, is yeah. that the theory? Uh, uh, the uh, the existing image cast is at end of life cycle. So in essence, you can't replace with this one. Is the is, is the real answer? Right. You can't replace one on one. What you what you're going to have to do if you're a county board is you're going to have to buy the ice machine as your BMD and buy a separate or keep either keep or buy a separate scanner to service your poll sites. That's that's in essence the practical yes. effect of this. Initially, what will happen though 
is that um, uh, boards will keep their image casts that are serviceable <laughs> for use in their small election districts where they would otherwise have to have a second uh, machine. Um, but 10 years down the road, when there won't be any image casts in use, or very few image casts still in use, um, you'll see B start to kick in. And B will probably have been gone by that, upgraded or fixed so that this issue well, doesn't we'll see. We could revisit exist. it right. if we have the experience to do it. And generally but, but, speaking, just this, the issue itself should somewhat be a at least this configuration of the machine would be somewhat of a short time right. issue because it's only because this current configuration that's up for consideration cannot function as a BMD and a scanner at the same time. It's mm -hmm. our understanding that Dominion's intent is to submit a machine that does do both things concurrently um, in the within the next year or so. Well, that's fine. And if that happens, I guess that would resolve all these issues. But I just, I, I have to tell you, I mean, based on our discussion, I still don't understand this this argument you're making because I do think that we've accommodated for people twice, which I, I I'm not saying I have a problem with because we should accommodate people, but I think the way this is presented is illogical. You've done double counting. I don't understand exactly why, but you have. Uh, I don't want to make people wait either, and if this helps people not wait, but I do think you're imposing a restriction on this that doesn't appear to me to be necessary. You've already done it with the 2700. You're doing it again with this. I mean I. My feeling is you're basically saying to counties, you just have to buy two machines. That's the answer. So buy two machines if you want to. Have a good day. Uh, but this is not really servicing both communities anymore. This is now a BMD machine, in essence, and you have to have a separate scanner for uh, people who don't want to use the BMD. Well, I guess that's a choice the counties are going to have to make. Um, I'm not sure what, inf you know, what, what, what this directive does exactly, because I don't think we've ever put a directive out before with a um, certification, but if that's what it'll take to get it through, I'm in favor of putting it through because I think the machine's been out there for a long time. I think it's been hanging for some time to get it certified. I think it should be certified because I think it's met all our requirements. Uh, but I do think imposing this additional uh, mandate or directive on the counties without what I consider to be a logical explanation or a logical reason uh, doesn't make much sense. But I don't want to hold this up for that. If the counties are willing to buy what you, you know, suggest they should buy, that's up to them. I understand. It's, it's a county decision, ultimately, to buy uh, voting machines. So I'm sure they're going to accommodate their voters. I think that's what counties do. I'm sure they're going to take whatever steps they have to take in order to make sure their, their voters are accommodated in their poll sites. So I am willing to uh, go along with this. But I will say, just I don't I still don't under understand the rationale here for this double counting. But uh, we've entertained a, a motion to adopt, <coughs> and um, I, would, I would entertain a second, and I appreciate your I second. And so are there, is there any other discussion? Then all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. So it is uh, adopted in its uh, current form. So that resolves that. And yeah, we, we, need, we need two separate two votes. votes. Oh, they, well, the motion was to approve. The motion was to approve both. Was for the I think we were just doing the whole thing, John. Both were adopted. Both were adopted. So we'll move on to um, the resolution on the IT system maintenance. This is a traditional resolution we brought to you in the past uh, because we're spending federal dollars. It requires a vote of the commissioners. And, it, and the cost exceeds five thousand right. dollars. Okay. So this is routine maintenance for systems that we have. I move the adoption of the resolution. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. That is also adopted. Now we'll go on to what is apparently the last City. item of new business. This is a discussion, I guess, of the democracy New York City letters that I've read about in the papers that was somewhat controversial down in New York City. Um, I know that the board was pursuing some information regarding how this came about and why there were mistakes made and how this all happened. And I don't know if you wanted to uh, update us on what the status of that is. Well, we're still pursuing the information. I mean, part of it was we received uh, what is what pertains to be the list 
that was sent out claiming it was based upon the enacted license, but um, you know, we're unable to at this point, even with our analysis, because they only gave us the limited information, name, first name, uh, last name, and address, is to figure out how this list was selected because no matter what we come up with, it's still less than what is over the last four years has been the inactive list in New York City. So it still raised the question of how these voters were selected and what was the criteria. What were the, what were the numbers? Uh, the, cur the current inactive list is at a, at a low was around 450,000. It fluctuates depending upon the year for 450,000 to, to 500,000 over the last four years. Uh, this list was less than that. 390, less than 400,000, a little less than 400,000, so there's a gap there. Mm -hmm. Plus, they had identified certain fields that were s supposedly contained in the list, which um, we didn't get in the list that was provided so to us. Determine. Right, so we can't determine that. Um, you know, we can try to do some looking up, but if we just match on name, uh, first name, you know, first name, last name, uh, that, because there's a lot of common surnames, that ends up matching like several thousand voters. So if we millions. whittle it down to part to, you can have the exact number. Now. Millions. Millions, right. Uh, if we whittle it down to the partial address, um, that, that can narrow it down, but it's still, it's still not accurate. So our, we can't even, even try to even do an analysis based so on that. So you got this information. That's correct. And now you've requested more information based on what you just said. We have. We submitted when was a second that? letter. That was uh, two days ago, three days ago. And you haven't heard anything back Friday? Not since then, that's correct. Uh, Friday, the 22nd was the second letter we sent out. So was that Monday? Important mm -hmm. item yes. on why we started in the first place was a number of voters um, had contacted the, both the state board and, and when we reached out to the city board, the city board, uh, because they were receiving information that their record was not uh, active voter. Uh, so when they the, the, the voters have contacted us and checked their record on the electronic lookup. It did show them as active voters, so they couldn't quite figure out: um, is this a scam? Is it real? Mm -hmm. It's right. a letter that wasn't signed. Is it really appropriate? So, just as as John had mentioned, when we saw people getting uh, contacting us because they were getting what they thought were scams in. Central New York, we reached out and tried to find out the source of the information. One of the hard parts is yes, there are, you know, they identify the city um, a, a democracy now um, and the chief democracy officer for the city of New York has been talking to us and, and uh, you know, we sent that office the letter asking for more information. We followed up after we received a response to say it's, it's incomplete. Um, but what is the, uh, we can't tell the vintage, you know, how old is the data that they use to tell people? Um, one of the items, as we've talked about in the past, when we had the situation in Brooklyn, we match the city file every weekend, and we get a report that we continue to look at, the city looks at to make sure that we are not having a repeat of anything like that. Uh, and right now we have about 561,000 inactive voters, and as Todd said, when you look back over history, We've been nowhere near this number. So one, um, how old is this data so that you're reaching out to voters and cl claiming to give them information? It's outdated at best. Uh, we asked for the data file so we could try to figure out how old is it. Uh, we could not, you know, anything that we've been able to look at has been inconclusive because of the very narrow uh, fields that they've provided us. Uh, so, so we've asked them for more information. We're going to continue to pursue it just so we can best understand it. What we did in response publicly is I think the best uh, uh, you know, way to provide information to voters in 11 days before election was uh, forget this information. Go to either the State Board of Election Lookup or the City Board of Election Lookup and look yourself up. And if that information is current and accurate with what you know is your residence address, then you should go to that polling place on election day and vote. It'll tell you if you're active or not. Um, but that's the place to go to vote. If that information is wrong, the city lookup site, city board of election lookup, will tell them the correct polling site for their residence address. 
uh, they should then go to that site based on their current residence address. That's where they'll need to vote an affidavit ballot. Other than that, we haven't figured out any other way of providing clarity or less confusion to the voters. Uh, and that's been a similar message uh, that we've discussed with the direct, you know, the executive team at the New York City Board of Election, which their communication. Why, why, would, why would someone not send you the information that you're asking? What would be the reason for not sending it? Um, I, I don't know. Um, Maybe they only sent a letter to a subset of people on the list. Well, okay. I just asked the question. But more, <laughs> one, one, but, <laughs> but, but one is the data to That's figure out the data. That's why they wouldn't want to send you the data. We well, thought the data would help us because then we could at least look for the data and, and then see of that list of voters, who, <laughs> how old is the list? That's what we wanted the data for. Well, we one of, one we of the, can't do that. One of, the other, one of the other elements is, is what is the source of this data? Because that is unknown right now. Yeah, but the, here's, the, a, here's, the, a, uh, here's a missive here. Um, did they want to send out what, postcards? Yeah, that was today's communication. Right. Another to, to the, fix the problem. How do you do that if you don't know what the problem was? Well, or you don't have the right list. That's fair. But, you know, the, the those who have commented on this have said the source of this is either the state or the city board. And both us and the New York City Board have gone back through their FOIL requests over the last, we did two years. We couldn't find anybody that we could identify as either being associated with Civis Analytics, which is the, the vendor that's claimed who produced the list, to request our, our list. And there are certain things in the fields that we know that they had to use that we wouldn't give out. So we're fairly confident it didn't come from us. So did it pass through third party hands to get to Civis Analytics and who are they and what are those sources? We don't know the answers to that and we haven't been given the answers to that yet. So I don't know if that's a reason why someone might withhold information. Well, it's very it, troubling. You know, <laughs> But we did, I mean, our initial communication was we didn't understand the source of the list. We strongly encourage that they rely on current information. Um, this Monday, we, the State Board received a FOIL from the Democracy New York City office. We, fit, we responded on Tuesday to provide them with current, you know, information. Um, Do you know who Civis Analytics is? It's a, sure. it's like an Arist I'd say it's like a vendor like Aristotle and any of the other kinds of vendors who do this kind of um, candidate support or list you know election related list nice. based in Chicago they the the people who found it, it seem to be associated with uh, uh, 2012 uh, Obama campaign I wonder why they use them so they didn't respond to your request of October 22nd? Not yet. Not yet. They said they're working on it in the, in the email that Commissioner Spano read. In December. And what about the 30, I mean, I read there were 30,000 active voters that got this letter as well. Is that true? I, I saw that report. I, I we, don't, we don't know that to be true then. Based on the information we have, we have not been able to verify that number yet. Except gotcha. that, except that one of these is that came supposed from? to go. One of these postcards is supposed to go to active voters. So well, uh, was that I what mean, it says on the title? Yeah. We, well, we we only know from the people who contacted us that they received this letter. So you don't know where the thirty thousand number came from? No. no. But it's probably. You said that New York City Democracy Project uh, foiled our list earlier in the week. This week, yes. yes. Yeah. So, we'll so they've probably taken our current list and um, matched it against the list they used to send out and now have a definitive list of their errors. Well, th they might now, but the 30,000 number was quoted before we gave them the FOIL. Okay. Yeah, that 30,000 so, that was, that was, that was but from they the probably, before the but FOIL. But they're certainly able to determine now to whom they erroneously mailed the letter. And that would be the basis for sending a follow-up correction letter to those people. Well, 
to confuse we'll them even that. further. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That's too bad. It, it's certainly unfortunate. Very unfortunate. That the mayor's office and the New York City Board of Elections don't get along well. Apparently it is. Apparently it's causing some confusion down in New York City, which yes. is the last thing they need. That's that's very unfortunate. The mayor seems to they paid not a lot of money respect for his own city agency. Publicly, huh? I'm sure they did. You know, two hundred thousand. So we're expecting a response to this letter that you sent. I'm hoping for a response, not expecting. Uh, the well, city sent it, right? They're not going to get it. We can follow up. The city of NYC is If they don't respond, there are remedies. Yes. There are remedies. Well, we're not the only one also. I mean, we have our responsibility. I know we've heard from um, uh, that the members of the city council have Mm -hmm. Asked for information. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure the appropriate committee, but they claim they're going to hold hearings. And uh, Mr. Stringer has also demanded information. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the city council will probably have hearings after the election. Um, or not. Or not. Well, I think they said they were having them. I think I think we can count on that in their communication. But I just don't think they've scheduled it yet. Because what are you going to do with this before election day from a hearing point of view? All yeah, right. Um, about how do you find out where the problems were so they don't get repeated? I understand the city council is planning that, I believe. Um, but certainly, because well, there's already we want, we want our own resolution to this. Mm -hmm. You know what? What? I mean, if they they claimed publicly the information came from us, we we're going to track that down. Um, how they use the information, how they may or may not have uh, understood it. Um, but certainly, the the. Just like um, any other group that uses those types of amalgamated lists that aren't current, that's not the best way to communicate with voters real live leading up to an election uh, and whether or not some other group is going to come next time. We, we want to make sure that people understand. You know, John uh, turns those foil around through our PIO office um, and the staff really quickly. Um, we want people to rely on current valid information. Well, and it's so it it, it, it it's so available. I mean, it isn't like it, they couldn't. Right. It, I find it curious that you would use a Chicago-based vendor to get information that's readily available from a New York State agency for or free. a New York for City free. agency. For yeah. Free. So you know, I mean, you and, can get up-to-date, accurate information from a city and/or state agency, and yet you choose to use a third-party vendor out of state that. In, in my view, has no reliability, no track record in this state that you could rely on. This is a government agency doing this, spending public money. I mean, it's 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 incredible to me that that's the way you would proceed as a state as a city agency. I don't think we'd ever think about pursuing information that's available from a state agency from a third-party vendor. It just it just makes no sense to me at all, and I think running this down is very important, and I think we should get answers to these questions. Well, I don't think we should jump to any conclusion, but we should get the answers. And then there's already a city they agency tasked with the responsibility of promoting voter participation, mm -hmm. and they tend to be pretty responsible in referring voters back to authoritative okay. sources like the New York City Board and us. They have lots of You're talking the campaign there. finance board. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. So right. this appears to be some sort of duplicative effort here as well. When why am I paying two state agencies or two city agencies to do the same thing? And do it poorly. We have to certify them. No less. I mean, we immediately reached out to campaign finance board to rule the men are out, and they made clear really quickly to us it wasn't them. Uh, Okay. Oh, one, the most important thing is when's oh. our next meeting? Yeah. Before we adjourn, we should set a new meeting. Is we there any other business to come before what, the... What, uh, what do we do if we don't hear back? Well, I don't know. That's a good question, but we should pursue it in whatever way we can. I'm not sure what our options are pursuing this agency. Well, I think their preliminary response is they're working on getting us the data. I mean, so they did respond I, to the I, first I, letter, so I have some hope they'll be responsive. They didn't ignore us the first time. We have subpoena power. Well... There you go. There you go. Well, I don't think we should put that on the table right now. <laughs> we already did in our letter. <laughs> yes, it's in the letter. Yeah.
I don't think you can make idle threats, so I think so we should we, we'll no, we consider it. We should consider it, so just <laughs> if needed. Hopefully it won't be needed. Hopefully we'll get cooperation. Based on the statute, we need to meet not later than December 15th in order to certify the results. That's a Saturday, so that would mean Friday the 14th would be the latest. 14th of what? December, to certify the election results. The U.S. House of Representatives had requested if we could give them the results by the 14th. So if we meet that day, we could. Uh, we, we won't meet the live in-person mail version, but we, we all, because it's so hard it is to get mail to uh, the is that, office. Can, so if we can meet on that Friday. Meet earlier than that, or is that pretty much it? Well, not much earlier. It takes that time for the counties to get the results. <laughs> Either the Friday the 14th. Or Thursday the 13th. Either way, it's Friday the 14th. We prefer the Friday the 14th. Is that okay? Thank you. Andy, how you doing? Um, we're talking about December. Huh? December 14th. Yeah. I just had to turn my phone on. That's fine. Take, Take your time. Take your time. That's supposed to be a snow. That's the 14th. <laughs> it says on your calendar <laughs> snow. <laughs> That's only in Long Island. It's 14th. They've got more snow than we have. All right, so we'll set it. We're going to set it for December 14th. Okay. At noon right here. Yep. So that'll be our next meeting. Uh, is there anything else? Or I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So uh, all Second. in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, and we are done. Thank you. I get yelled at.